Okay. Yeah. Glenn, welcome to the Science and Chill podcast. Oh, hello. Thanks for having me on. Of course. I have been looking forward to our conversation. Um, I have also been kind of uh, digesting a lot of your podcast episodes as well and, and learning a lot. So congrats on launching that. I know you're you. fairly recent to the podcast scene, but inside exercise for those who who want to uh, check it out. Um, so Glenn, before we get started, um, can you just give listeners a brief introduction to yourself, maybe a little bit about your research history, where you're currently located and what types of projects you are currently working on? All right. Well, it's a bit of an interesting one, a bit of a different one, because I'm, I'm only, in inverted commas, 60, um, but I've uh, basically, I took a package for my work. So at the moment, I'm actually not working. I'm what's called an emeritus professor uh, at Victoria University, and I basically just do my podcast. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I started off um, so in Australia. So I did my undergrad at a place called University of Wollongong, which people might actually know because last weekend, was the World Championships of Cycling was in mm. Wollongong, which is pretty fun. Um, so it's like human movement, we call it here, which sounds like you know, a bit of a strange name, but it's basically sports science. Um, and then I did uh, my master's with David Postel, which is a bit of a big name from, from back in the day at Ball State. Uh, and then PhD at Melbourne Uni. So basically, PhD was looking at carbohydrate availability. So how does alterations in glycogen affect glucose use, glycogen use, and fat use during exercise? And then going the other way, so having like just the same glycogen, but then ingesting carbohydrate and seeing how that affects glycogen use, glucose use, and fat use. So doing muscle biopsies, tracer, glucose tracers, and things like that. But then, um, yeah, then I was at like Monash Uni for eight years and then University of Melbourne. For, so these are all in Australia for seven years. And then I ended up at this uh, Victoria University. So it's all in Melbourne uh, for like 10 years. So basically carbohydrate metabolism, um, which, you know, is obviously the focus today is, is is what I've been doing. But as I said, towards the end, I had like a whole bunch of teaching and I had trouble getting grants. And I was like, this is not what I'm, this is not fun anymore. So uh, and it was like, it was the, uh, in the middle of COVID and my mum died in New Zealand. And I couldn't get there because of lockdowns. And I was like, you know what, this is not, you know, this is not fun. So I, I pulled out and that was December, 2020. Yeah. Got it. And um, so what, what got you interested in saying, uh, exercise metabolism or exercise are you do you have a background in athletics were you like a runner or cyclist I, I often find that uh, people in our area who are doing research often sort of yes. start out as either being an endurance athlete or, or something like that and you know all the strength training either a strength training junkie or sort of an endurance junkie and that's how exactly you kind of get right into exercise I know that's the same that's a good question so I've been asking that question in my podcast because I realize almost everyone has started off as a sports person and so was I so um yeah, I was like a distance runner. Um, I was a bit late actually starting up. I kind of dicked around. I got a, I repeated like uh, primary school mm. and I repeated high school. I was like not the best student. I would not go. I would go to the horse races every Wednesday. I had a really check it past. And um, it wasn't until 23 I started my undergrad and I was a, a runner. Yeah, a, a distance runner. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was actually quite interesting. What happened was I, just gone for a long run with my two mates. They both were like training for the Hawaii Ironman. And I was like, just a runner. And not just a runner. I was actually pretty decent. And um, I saw they had this tech, he had this um, book. It was called Fox and Matthews, a classic exercise physiology book. Like sitting there in his kitchen, like just in the, in the, um, in the bookshelf. And I just grabbed it, looked at it. And it was like talking about ATP and glycogen. And I was like, how do you even do this stuff? And he goes, oh, you do a muscle biopsy. Why? You can do a biopsy. And like the next day, my mum was all excited because I was actually interested in something. So we drove down to Wollongong. Was like, how do you get? It? How do you do this course? Like, quick, get this, get them in there. And um, yeah, and then I just thought I was going to fail, and I worked really hard, and I blitzed it, and then off I went. So it was a bit of a bit of a different start. But yeah, I was a distance runner. Yeah, that's interesting. And you know, oftentimes it only you just have to find something you're. You know, you mentioned that you weren't necessarily a great student, but sometimes you just got to find something you're interested in, and <laughs> take, it takes off from there. Absolutely. I, I literally thought I was going to fail. And I would like go to the library to it closed and close at 10 o'clock. I would go there. I'd treat it like a job because I'd already worked. So I would like go nine to five. And even if I only had a few classes, I'd go to the library. Then I'd go for my run, have something to eat, go back to the library till 10 o'clock at night, thinking I was going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably the best thing, you know, like a carrot, you know, like you are going to fail, dude. And um, I didn't. And then, and then I just get uh, you know, I was like, holy crap, I'm not too bad at this. So, yeah. 
yeah. And then you know, eventually got a PhD and eventually started teaching this stuff. So, <laughs> um, and so today, kind of one of the main things that we're, we're going to talk about, you know, you mentioned carbohydrate metabolism has been a focus of a lot of your research over the years. Um, it's a very, you know, not only is this like a very, you know, central topic to exercise metabolism, it also seems to be a very uh, popular topic, you know, everyone talking about fat adaptation and how different diets can affect performance. So I hope to get into all of that today and clear some things up and hopefully learn some things myself. So I want to begin kind of maybe with the basics. So just, you know, carbohydrate metabolism during exercise. So you and I right now we're, we're resting, we're you know, sitting, not really using most of our muscles besides maybe our, our brain. Um, and you know, say one of us got up and, and started to exercise or when we started to exercise, what happens, um, in skeletal muscle that starts to increase our utilization of fuel. And so maybe you can talk about that in two parts. I know, you know, we, we can be using fat for energy. We can be using carbohydrates, but when we start to exercise, what happens to increase our uptake of these fuels into the muscle and sort of why is that important from a performance perspective? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good question. It's actually, you know, it's probably pretty complicated what goes on there, but um, basically, you know, you're sitting here, as you said, probably the only muscles we're using are, are around our mouth. <laughs> um, but yeah, once you get up, it's, it's going to be a very slight, change in the muscle just talking about like get up and walk to the fridge or something there's going to be a slight you know sort of energy de deficit in the muscle because that is a thing called atp which i'm sure you this is no um just the yeah so and then just have a slight breakdown of atp you get some adp which is like the the next level down but also when your muscles contract you get calcium released and that causes the contractions but it also stimulates some of the the enzymes in the muscle so um, you know, without getting into the, the exact ones yet, we can do later, but they essentially cause, um, you know, breakdown of, of, of glycogen. So they turn on these pathways. So you start to maybe use a little bit of glycogen, probably not much when you just walk in the fridge. So they mean mainly fat, a little bit more fat, and maybe a little bit more glucose, um, you know. But, but if you got up and did a sudden sprint, it'd be very different, right? Not only would it be kind of shocking. And I actually don't, I did that. I tried to. I did that in the teaching once. I just suddenly like sprinted up the stairs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what would I have used? I wouldn't do that now because I've pulled my calf. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, you know, so if you sprint up the stairs, it's a bit different. You'd have some, you know, you break down some glycogen to lactate and whatever and creating phosphate and whatever. But basically it's just the little signals that change in the muscle. Yeah, it's the main thing. Right, you know, so it's the hormonal changes and stuff. But initially it's going to be mainly changes in the muscle. Right. So mainly it's kind of, it's basically based on demand, essentially at the beginning, you know, our, as our demand for ATP increases, the muscle has to, you know, meet that demand by producing energy. Um, and it uses these different fuel sources to do that. And so I know, um, kind of classically, we're taught that at rest, we're say using mostly fat for fuel. Uh, so oxidative kind of metabolism, um, how does the rate and maybe the percentage of carbohydrate oxidation change with the intensity of exercise. So you mentioned yeah, earlier, so you know, we could have low intensity exercise. We can start going for a walk. We can maybe pick up the pace to say a moderate intensity aerobic, like jog type thing. And then we have high intensity exercise where we're exactly. near, near our max. So how does carbohydrate oxidation and maybe, you know, um, on the other hand, fat oxidation change as the intensity of exercise increases? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I like the way you clarified earlier. I should have said that myself. So basically you know, you have an increase in demand. So so when you're contracting your muscles, you know, they're doing work. And and depending on how uh, much work they do, they need more, more energy, naturally. And so then you start going, well, how fast do you need that energy? And that's the basic thing that when you get energy from fat, um, you know, you can get a whole bunch of energy, right? You get a lot of energy, but it's slower. So you're getting less energy um, rate. So if you're going slow, so, you know, in simple terms, the classic sort of studies have done like 25% of VO2 max, 65% of VO2 max, 85% of VO2 max, and then, you know, sprints and things like that. 25% of VO2 max, you're ma mainly using fat, right? And you're not even like really touching your, your muscle glycogen because you've, you've that's kind of precious. It's stored there. You touch it more when you need it at higher intensities. So mainly fat. And a little bit of glucose. And then you go to 65% um, of VO2 max. And this is in trained people they did the study in. And it's 50-50. So it's a beautiful, you know, it's simple. So 65% VO2 max, it's 50-50. But then you've got a breakdown within that of, you know, muscle fat, 
plasma fat, glucose, and glycogen. And then you go up to like 85%. So 50, 50% would be like uh, maybe a brisk walk or something, depending on how fit you are. 85% um, is pretty hard. You know, like it's, 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 if you're running it, if you could do 20 minutes, you'd be doing pretty well. Um, that is mainly carbohydrate and not much fat. And then, you know, if you're doing sprints and stuff like that, then it's a whole different, you know, you start talking about sort of more anaerobic metabolism, things like that. The thing I'm talking about here, 25%, 65%, 85%, it's all pretty much entirely uh, aerobic. There's a little bit of anaerobic, but very small. And, and as I said, when you're going slow, it's mainly fat. And then it, and then it, I don't like saying switching. The students always want to keep it simple. They go, there's fat, and then it switches to carbohydrate. No, no, it's a continuum, right? So it's a, a very slight increase in carbohydrate and a slight decrease in fat as you increase the intensity. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I'm glad that you clarified that, Glenn, because there often I, I see the same sort of um, language being used when people are talking about, oh, well, you're burning fat or you're burning carbs. It's like it's one or the <laughs> other. And like the body doesn't Mainly work like fat. The body doesn't no. work like that. It's on a spectrum. I mean, even when we're at rest doing nothing, you know, sure, a, major a majority of our energy is coming from fat oxidation, but we're still getting a little bit of contribution from glucose. And there are some areas in the body that are only using glucose because that's all they can use, whether it's like the brain or, you know, Absolutely. red blood cells and things like that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very glad you said that. And that is a big thing. It's just like, I, I always say, and I, I usually will put up in an lecture or whatever, I'll put up something where it'll say like in a marathon, it's 98% aerobic and it's mm -hmm. still like two percent for example because it's, it's the people want black and white it makes it easier and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned also just sitting here because even that's that not that clear because i haven't actually had anything to eat yet so you know we're on opposite, opposite time zones and um, so it's so 8 a.m for me i haven't actually eaten anything yet so i'd be burning almost you know very very high percentage of fat but if i'd actually had breakfast like if if, if half an hour ago i'd had breakfast i'd be burning mainly carbohydrates because because the it's actually in the blood mm -hmm. and, and instead of using the energy to store it, like the body's always been efficient, right? So you might think, why are you burning carbohydrate when you're sitting there doing nothing? And it's because I've just eaten, my insulin would have gone up, the glucose has gone up in the blood, and the body's gonna be like, Well, why why waste energy storing and everything? Let's just burn the thing. You know what I mean? So, you know, as we know, glucose goes up after a meal and then it comes down. And that's because you're actually using it, you're storing it and burning it. So again, you know, if you're fasted and we're sitting here doing nothing, then yeah, absolutely, we're burning mainly fat. But if you've eaten, then it changes things. So um, yeah, but but your point is entirely right that when you're doing not much, you're burning mainly fat. As you increase the intensity, you burn more carbohydrate. Yeah, and then it starts to the, the mix changes as well. So as you start to exercise harder and harder, you start to use more glycogen and, and, and rather than glucose. So that's another level. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess maybe that's something that I um, know a little bit less about. So what, when, or like why, I guess, does the switch say from, from glucose to glycogen occur? Is that simply sort of a supply thing as well? So, you know, when we're maybe in the initial stages, we're just going to use glucose. And then as the demand kind of ramps up, we have to start releasing in the, or breaking down and then releasing muscle glycogen or how does that like, yeah, yeah. switch occur? Yeah, it's actually pretty fascinating how that works. And I guess we don't know exactly how it works, but we can kind of surmise based on some of the, the sort of uh, the biochemistry, I guess. So an important thing, which is different, is that glycogen, when you break it down, you get slightly more so just clarify, people know how ATP is, right? You talked about that? Or, yeah, we could actually, uh, I mean, if you wanted to maybe just briefly kind of uh, go through the ATP uh, pathway, we don't have to use uh, all the glycolytic enzymes in the, in the description. No, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to do all the, yeah. If you want to do kind of a, base, a basic overview of how ATP is produced, I think that might be helpful for some people. So why don't we go ahead and, and do that? Yeah. So basically, ATP is, is adenosine triphosphate, right? So I'm only, I'm only saying that because the adenosine is like a, well, okay. The triphosphate bit. So it's three phosphates. Tri tri means three, right? So you've got this sort of backbone thing and you've got these three phosphates. And basically that's what makes the world go around with in terms of energy. You have three phosphates, and there's all energy in those bonds, right? They're holding it, they're held together. So when you break down the ATP, so you take one phosphate off and it becomes ADP. So adenosine diphosphate. So now you've got two phosphates, and then that other phosphate's just loose. You're actually releasing that energy in that bond, right? And and you cannot create or destroy energy, right? So so when you release that energy, it has to go somewhere. So that energy is used. So it's like coupled, 
So part of that energy, a large part of that energy is used to actually do the contraction, right? But then some of it's given off as heat. So that's why you get hot, right? So when you break down the ATP to ADP, you harness that to do the contraction and you have some heat and you have some other stuff going on, like maintaining your electrolyte balance in the muscle and all that stuff, okay? So that's AD, ATP to ADP. And then when you eat, the idea is that you go the other way, right? So then you're resynthesizing, right? It's a bit simplistic, but basically when you, you've got to go back to ATP again. So whether you're eating or you're just using other pathways to resynthesize it, you go from ADP and then you need to add that energy in to put that phosphate back on again to have ATP, yeah? And that's what actually makes the world go around because when you're exercising, you're breaking down the ATP to ADP during the contraction, and then you've got other pathways like the fat pathway, you know, the glycogen, the glucose, to put that AT, that phosphate back on again so then you can break it down again. So it goes round and round and round and round, okay? And that's why it's 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 important to sort of clarify. So so basically, when we're talking about during exercise, you're burning glycogen or glucose or fat or whatever. When we're saying burning, it's essentially we're using that to put the phosphate back on. Okay. So um, yeah. So in terms of, and that's why I needed to explain that because glycogen, you get slightly more ATP for every glycogen molecule you break down. So. Uh, you get like one more ATP, which doesn't sound like much. Mm. Okay. But if you're doing anaerobic metabolism, which we haven't really talked about yet, you're getting three ATP from maybe glycogen, you're getting two from maybe glucose. You can't tell me that's not much. When you're doing aerobic metabolism, you're getting 30 odd, right? So 30 or so from uh 30, you know, three or something like that from glycogen. It's a bit debated. We used to always say 36, 37, mm. but so just say, we'll say 36. So just say you're getting 36 from glucose, you're getting 37 from glycogen. That's not much different, right? But when you're doing a sprint and you're mainly using glycolysis to break down, to produce lactate, you're actually getting three from glycogen and two from glucose. So that's part of the reason. You get more bang for your buck from glycogen. But the other thing is the glycogen's really precious. It's sitting in the muscle already. You've taken it up, you've stored it. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, it takes energy. So to take that glucose from the blood, so just to clarify to people, you have a meal, obviously it depends what you eat, but you're going to have some carbohydrate in there, hopefully. That depends on, on your philosophy. Maybe, I'm, right, maybe. I'm a, bit of a, I'm a bit of a carbohydrate fan, because it's, anyway, we can talk about that a bit. Um, so you've had your meal, you've got some carbohydrate in there, it gets broken down, absorbed, most of it ends up as glucose, it gets to taken up into the liver and the muscle mainly, also fat, and converted to glycogen. So you've taken energy to take that up. Whenever you synthesize something, it takes energy. So it's sitting in the muscle, right? And you've only got a certain amount of it. But then you've got this glucose floating around the blood. If you've got the time, so if you're going slowly and you've got the time that you can actually take it up from the blood and use it, then that's what the body does, right? And it thinks, let's leave this glycogen for, you know, something more intense, mm. okay? Because it took energy to take it up. I've stored it. Why would I pull it out of there when I can, I've got the time to take it up from the blood? Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's very efficient because, like you said, it's it's stored in the muscle. It's very localized, so it's right there whenever you need it. And that it would yeah, it's more... right there whenever you need it. But it took energy to store it. So again, if you had to use some ATP to store it, if I can take up this glucose, and it's actually more efficient energy wise to take it up and use it and leave that glycogen for something more intense then the body will. And indeed, if it's really intense, it's like, sweet, I'm getting three ATP for maybe glycogen. I'm only getting two from maybe glucose. So you want to spare that glycogen. So that's basically what happens. So when you're going slowly, you burn mainly fat and a little bit of glucose and no glycogen. Really. When you're going at 65% VO2 max, um, where it's the 50-50, then you're using some glycogen and some glucose. It's about even. But then you, when you go up to 85%, which is the one I said you could only hold for probably 20 minutes if you're lucky, then you're using mainly glycogen, uh, a bit more glucose. So basically what happens is the glucose goes up with each intensity, but the glycogen doesn't like even start until 65 and then it goes mm. nuts. Yeah, Very, so... Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And so I guess what I want to... I kind of lost what I was going to ask about. So the the glycogen contribution. So when you hit that sixty five percent, is that 
going to be maybe an equal contribution of liver and muscle glycogen, or is it going to be muscle glycogen first and then liver glycogen once you start to, say, deplete muscle glycogen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So first of all, if we clarify it, so when I'm talking about glucose being taken up and used for energy, we don't actually, I haven't stipulated whether that's coming from the liver, which it would be if you were fasted, but if, you, if you've done an overnight fast, but generally what's happening is you're going to have some from the liver and some from the gut because, you know, People always think, oh, yeah, okay, you're exercising, drinking a sports drink. No, but often you've just got, you know, food. So if mm -hmm. you've eaten within a few hours, you're going to have some digestion going on. So you'll get some coming from the liver and some coming from the gut. And that's actually really cool because that's studies we did back in, holy crap, 1995. We were the first, I'm pretty sure we were the first in humans where we actually had this thing called a double tracer. So we had a one tracer of glucose, which means we modif we modify the glucose slightly so you can like basically put a tag on it. And we're, that meant so we had one tracer we infused in the blood so we could work out the liver glucose output. And then one tracer we put in the drink so mm -hmm. you can see how much was coming from the glucose in the drink. And that was really cool because you could you could actually see that when you drank, it turned off the liver. Because it's like, oh, why release it from the liver when you've got it coming from the from the gut? So the body's ingenious, you know? Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. fascinating. Yeah, because I often say to students, like, you know, they, they want to rote learn things. Okay, I'll just not say everyone does that, but they want to rote learn things. So, for example, with, with you know, the sympathetic and not... So when you mm. think about adrenaline release, they'll go, hang on, does that cause your eyes to dilate or constrict? So get bigger or smaller? Does it make your heart rate go faster or slower? And I'd say, just think about it. You know, if you have an adrenaline rush, mm -hmm. the tiger jumps out, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to constrict my my uh, eyes so I can't see very well. No, so that adrenaline makes it dilate. You know? What's it going to do to your heart rate faster? You know, so it makes sense, and it's the same with um, carbohydrate ingestion. You go, oh, hang on, would that decrease the liver glucose output or increase it? Well, you've got glucose from coming from the gut. Why would you bother releasing your precious glucose you've already got stored as glycogen in the liver? Yeah. So, and so there's your answer. As, yeah. as far as, and we don't have to go too deep into this, but as far as the uh, intestinal absorption is there, do we have like glucose transporters in the intestine? And then I assume that's how they're getting like absorbed back into the bloodstream. Is that sort of the, the pathway exactly. for that? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, 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 there's glucose transporters in the gut. Yeah. Mainly the small intestine. Um, so yeah, you, you drink it. So a whole bunch of studies have been done with that. So during my master's, we were, we were doing gastric emptying studies. So you'd, drink different drinks and then you put a tube down your nose and suck out the contents and see how much ended up in the gut. And then another guy, Carl Gazolfi, was a classic. He'd put this like lo triple lumen thing into your small intestine and work out how much was being absorbed and if you added salt, didn't have salt, and mm. if you had glucose and fructose and whatever. So they've done all those studies, yeah. So, yeah, you absorb it from the small intestine. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. So if it's just glucose, it'll basically just go straight through into the small intestine. But if it's, um, you know, if it's bread or something, then when you're actually chewing it, you've got these things called amylase in the, in the, in the mouth, and that starts to break it down. So, so the idea is you break it down from, like, what's called a polysaccharide, which is, like, lots of molecules joined together, down to, like, a monosaccharide, which is just one, so glucose or fructose or whatever, galactose, and you absorb it. So that goes to the blood and then, you know, it either goes, gets taken up by the liver or it passes through the liver and you get a, a shot at, it, at the muscle. And that's that, even that's really fascinating because again, the body is smart. So sometimes it goes, oh, let's take it up in the liver. But other times it goes, hang on, the muscle needs it more. So most of it actually goes through the liver and the muscle gets the first shot at it. And that's going to so, yeah, depend depends. on demand. So say if you were exercising or if you were maybe had just exercised, is that sort of going to determine like the fate of that, whether it gets maybe stored in the liver or taken back exactly. up by the muscle? Exactly. But also if the liver is depleted or not. So yeah, getting back to your initial sort of question. So if you're just say you're fat, that's what makes it so much easier. A lot of the studies we did and others did, you do not, you get them in in the morning and they're fasting. Mm -hmm right? And then off you go. And then it's kind of nice if you're doing glucose traces or whatever, you, you know that the all the glucose is coming from the liver and whatever. It's not necessarily real, real world, right? So then later on, you start going, well, maybe we should have them, you know, have breakfast first and all that sort of stuff, right? But um, yeah, so if we just, 
consider it fasted, then yeah, you start exercise. If it's low intensity, you're mainly using fat and a little bit of glucose. That glucose is coming from liver and not really glycogen. Then if you're at 65%, which is like a, a slow jog or whatever, then you'll be using like 50-50 and you'll have, again, glucose coming from the liver and, and about the same amount of um, muscle glycogen that you're using for energy. Yeah. But then, yeah, as I said, in the real world, that glucose could be coming from a bit from the gut, a bit from the liver. Uh, it'll depend on the situation. So as you said, if you're fasted um, or if you've exercised and you've depleted your liver glycogen, then your liver's going to tend to take up more of that glucose and, and store it as glycogen, yeah? Um, if your liver's um, full, it's going to tend to pass through more. But but one thing which is really weird is that the liver is not very good at taking up glucose. It's, it's, it's basically under most situations, well, I don't know, I'm not a liver, I'm not a total liver guy. I'm not I'm sorry, I'm mainly a muscle guy. I'm not a liver guy, really. I've done a little bit. But the 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 liver is not going to take out glucose. That, that's it's really at first you think that's weird because it comes from the gut, it has to pass through the liver before it gets to the periphery. But most of it goes straight through. So it's called the indirect pathway, where quite a lot of the glucose goes straight through and gets taken up on the second pass, or it may even get converted to, to lactate or something like that, and then get taken up. Um, it's not the best at taking other things are taken up better, like fructose, for example. It's taken up better by the liver than glucose. So that's a really weird. I remember my undergrad, I actually did a lit, lit review on that. It was called the indirect pathway of glucose or something like that. And I was just like, wow, that's really interesting. So it's maybe a bit complicated for, for some people, but it's it's life. Sorry, physiology is complicated and exercise physiology is another level on top of it. So yeah yeah certainly i think we wish it would be you know very uh straightforward but oftentimes it's not uh you know we learn like you said we learn kind of these rote things about exercise metabolism and it's like well yes but like in one context maybe all this stuff applies and then in all of these other i mean physiology is so oh, complex yeah. and that in one situation the body's not going to do the same thing but i mean it's it's cool to think about all of these things that you're you know talking about now because i think and it might apply to sort of what we're talking about later when we talk about different effects of training and diet and all of that and how that can change physiology. So yes, what we, you know, exactly. learn in the, in the, what we learn in the textbooks might not apply, you know, to 50, 60% of people who are in these different physiological scenarios. Um, so it's well, all just, I guess, it, I guess that's why you need the, you know, the textbooks, you're going to have like energy metabolism mm -hmm. and then, you know, and if you're lucky, it might, well, if you're lucky, if you're like me and you like that sort of thing, you'll have different chapters for each, you know, glucose and glycogen and fat and whatever. But then you've always got later on the effect of training, the effect of gender, the effect of altitude. So then you can say, well, you know, we said how this much glycogen is used at this intensity, but if you're at altitude, this will happen. If you're, you know, if you're trained, you'll use less or whatever. So, but yeah, it does get complicated. I have been known to say in lectures, it's not my fault. You know, <laughs> like I didn't design this thing. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, we didn't get consulted in the in the design phase. <laughs> um, and what is my fault? But what is my fault? You may have picked up already. Is I tend to be a bit of a purist where I, I, I have difficulty saying, like, you know, so you say we're sitting here burning fat. For me, I just have difficulty holding back and saying, well, it depends if you just ate some carbohydrate or not. Right. So that's probably, it. sometimes it gets a bit complicated and you have to think what level are the students at. It's just going to dumb it down a little bit. So that's what I have trouble with sometimes, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it's, yeah, you have to decide, you know, who your audience is and how much information do they need? How much should we withhold from them? And to be and honest, all, I'm all not kind of stuff. entirely clear what your audience is. I'm, I haven't, that's some one thing I didn't ask you. So yeah, I think, you know, most of people listening now are, it's, a, I think, a broad, a broad audience. So a lot of people may have backgrounds in biochemistry or, or physiology, but a lot okay. of people may be learning this stuff for the first time. Done. So in either way, you Perfect. know, I think we're making a, we're having a good balance between deep dives and surface level stuff. So it's, it's great for everybody. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, so one more thing about glycogen kind of before we, before we move on, you know, there's the common going back to sort of just, you know, common things we hear or learn, you know, you'll often hear people say, Oh, you know, you have about 
enough glycogen to last you say 90 to 120 minutes during exercise if you're not taking in any sort of exogenous fuel source so if i go out in the morning and you know i want to maybe i'm going to go on a 20 mile run or something like that so i don't know, maybe take me that'd take me over well around two hours maybe if i'm if i'm really cruising but uh you know how how 20 coach, mile will take you two hours yeah, I guess maybe not. Maybe quite a bit longer. I'm overestimating. My I know. I'm just right saying now. that's impressive. I, I think just leave. No, it I, I don't think in my peak shape I could have done that. So maybe two and a half. No, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> um, I said remember I used to be a runner, so I'm I'm, I'm alert to these comments. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So um, if if we were to do that without any sort of exogenous, you know, fuel sources, you'll hear about people saying, oh, you know, in a marathon, you, you hit the wall because your glycogen runs out. How, how, yeah. how kind of true is that about, you know, how much glycogen we store and how, how long that can last us? Again, yeah. with the caveats that this is going to depend on your rate of glycogen utilization, how trained you are, because trained people may use a little exactly. bit less of that. So sort of how much can we store? Um, how much glycogen can we store? Like how long will it last us during exercise? Um, could we maybe just review a bit of a bit of the truth and yeah, yeah, sure. it's about that. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, okay. So what, what I think of uh, straight away is a classic study by a guy called Eddie Coyle. So he's um in, in Austin. Um, so what he did is he got, again, we'll just start with trained people because, you know, obviously trained people are going to be more likely to want to exercise two or three hours, obviously, you know, at a decent intensity. Mm -hmm. So Eddie Coyle got these trained um, people in. They exercise at 70% VO2 max. So that's something that, that if you don't have carbohydrate, like if you don't take in some extra, they lasted three hours. Okay. So 70% VO2 max in a trained person. And I've done similar studies. So I think I think we got like two hours 51. So yeah, you get them in. 70% is kind of like decent. Um, you know, it's probably like in a trained person, a heart rate of 140, 145, something like that. You know, depending, and then anyway, so they they and then the study they went same workload to exhaustion. So basically, you go seventy percent for as long as you can. They went three hours when they didn't have carbohydrate ingestion, and and he did muscle biopsies, and you could see the glycogen came down. And at the end, it wasn't. This is another thing. One of my podcasts I just did was um was a big discussion about do you actually get fully depleted of glycogen mm -hmm. or not, and all this sort of stuff. But basically. They were like depleted, like they were down about twenty percent or whatever, and that that, and then it didn't didn't go any lower, even when they drank carbohydrate. So so it went down three hours. They stopped. Now it's tempting to say they stopped because of glycogen depletion, but we don't really know that. Okay, mm -hmm. and then when they had the carbohydrate ingestion, it's a beautiful study because he did the biopsy. And I actually had Eddie Coyle on to talk about something else um, a few weeks ago. It goes down exactly the same. The glycogen we used to think the carbohydrate spares glycogen that it went down exactly the same the glycogen and they got to three hours and they kept going okay and they went four hours right so it's a classic study so they went one hour longer and then you can debate and say well that was the same workload to exhaustion what if they were doing like a time trial or whatever but you know because it's different but yeah basically they went an hour longer and the interesting thing was they didn't really use any more glycogen. So that's why you say, well, what's going on? The glycogen cause the fatigue or whatever. So when they drank the carbohydrate, they were able to go longer. We could talk about what's going on there, if you like. But that gives you an idea. But it, but again, and based naturally based on what we talked about earlier, it depends on the intensity. So if they were going at like, instead of 70%, if they were going like 80% VO2 max, right, then a trained person can last about an hour. So I've done studies on this. They went like 70 minutes and we did with them without carbohydrate and it actually didn't make much difference. But basically the point is they use their glycogen at a faster rate because it's a higher intensity and therefore you can't go as long. Yeah. And so that gives you a bit of an idea. Yeah. So it was, you said when they lasted four hours, they were, they were taking in exogenous carbohydrate. Right? Exactly. Right. So that okay. extra hour. Yeah. So, so what they did there was when they had just water. So what that we did a whole bunch of these studies as well. What you do is you give them like an artificially flavored and artificially mm -hmm. sweetened um, drink, and they can't tell the difference. But sometimes I'd ask them after at the end, and they wouldn't. They'd guess, and they were like half right and half wrong. Like they they can't tell the difference. So so they'd go um, yeah they go three hours, and when they drank the cup. So if you want to talk more about that, I can tell you what happens when you drink the carbohydrate. Or yeah, let's go in. Let's go ahead and do that. All right. So, yeah, the glycogen goes down and you stop. And then is that the fatigue or not? Okay. But what we know is the carbohydrate availability is definitely important because 
you say, well, did the glycogen depletion cause them to fatigue? Well, we don't know. It looks like it. But when they drank the carbohydrate, so when they took in their, um, you know, it could be a sports drink, it could be anything. We used to make up just sugar and water, add some cordial in some of our studies. Um, when they go an hour longer, you say, okay, that's interesting because what happens is the carbohydrate, now this is what we haven't really talked about that clearly, carbohydrate oxidation. So how much you're actually burning um, aerobically, right? So when you're doing like 70% for three hours, obviously it's, it's, it's almost entirely aerobic. Now, so what you can do is you can measure the carbohydrate oxidation. So what rate of carbohydrate are you burning? So they were burning about two grams. I can't remember now. I think two and a half grams of carbohydrate per minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then that went along nicely, whether they drank carbohydrate or not, for the first hour. And then it started to drop in the one that they were just drinking the placebo. Okay. So they weren't getting carbohydrate. The carbohydrate oxidation started to drop. And then it sort of dropped pers pers what do you call it? badly, uh, precipitously. precipitously. There you go. It dropped, and then they fatigue, right? Now, when you drink the um, carbohydrate, the carbohydrate oxidation stayed up, so they were able to continue to burn carbohydrate, and then they went longer. Okay, so obviously the carbohydrate variability was important because what happens is your glucose is fine for the first hour as well, we and others have shown this. If you drink carbohydrate or not, obviously when you drink carbohydrate, your glucose will be higher, right? But if you don't drink glucose, it's totally fine for the first hour because, as you touched on earlier, the liver is releasing glucose. Mm -hmm. So even though you're burning more glucose, the liver's releasing more glucose and you're able to maintain the glucose concentration for the first hour. It's almost like exactly an hour, and then it starts to drop. So... After that first hour, the glucose drops. If you drink carbohydrate, you maintain that glucose all the way to the end. Right? I'm talking about you've got to drink it, you know, you know, every 15 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you fatigue, right? And you've got an hour longer. And we showed with our tracer studies, you know, where we infused a, a modified glucose, we showed that the glucose uptake of the muscle was much higher when you drank the carbohydrate, which makes sense. So essentially, you're going along. So if we start at the start, what's happening to glucose? You're maintaining it. Because you're maintaining it, you're maintaining a nice gradient between the blood and the muscle, and you've got other reasons as well. So you take up the glucose, you use the glucose, so therefore you're able to substitute for that lack of glycogen, and you maintain your carbohydrate oxidation, and you go longer. But then you fatigue, and we don't know why. Okay, but that's another story. That was that was going to be my next question. You know, what what prevents them from going five hours or six hours? I mean, I know eventually you get, you know, a actual peripheral type of fatigue probably where I'm sure like calcium regulation and all of that kind of stuff is exactly is out of whack. So it's not just fatigue is more than fuel. And at some point, you know, exactly. when you extend the distance or duration enough, it, it becomes that's even mental as well. Or it's mental just mental. I'm done after four hours of exercise, I'm I'm ready to get the hell off of the treadmill or the bike or whatever I'm on. So <laughs> it's it's really a fascinating question. And I, I don't think we know the answer. Um, mm -hmm. well, okay. Well I say we a lot of people have looked at this and they're trying to look at because sometimes it's like, you know, I mentioned calcium was released when you contract, and there's, mm -hmm. there's some evidence that you know glycogen, you know, is right there with the calcium release channels and all this sort of stuff, and maybe this and that. But it doesn't, nothing seems to really. So if people do want to, I'm plugging my own podcast a bit, but if you want to listen to a guy, I had Jorgen Janssen on like two weeks ago, and that was this whole thing. Like, you know, what what is actually happening with carbohydrate? Why are we fatiguing and things like that? So but basically, it's really weird because I remember thinking about that. It's like, what the hell? And we even did a study where we did like a biopsy. Someone else did it first, and then we followed up. We do like a biopsy before they fatigue and then biopsy after. So, so if you do the placebo ride first, and you know how long they went. Mm -hmm. So you do like a biopsy at the end, and then you give them the carbohydrate. So it's not randomized, but you're, looking, you're not, you know, you're actually looking at the mechanisms. So you do the placebo ride first, do the biopsy at the end. So then you can measure the ATP and the creatine phosphate, the lactate, the glycogen, and all these other things, AMP. That's so ADP, you know, I said that breakdown box. Mm -hmm. Measure all that stuff. And then you do the same exact ride again with carbohydrates so they go longer, and you biopsy them at the end, and you can't see, like, nothing special happens. You can't see it. 
in terms of the energy, right? So, but it's really weird because you go, hang on a minute, they fatigue and they're totally hydrated because we drink, give them a drink every 15 minutes. They are, glucose is perfect, same as at rest. And they stop and you go, hang on, and the, and the glucose uptake is going like this, like our glucose uptake with the tracer, it just kept going up and up and up. And you go, what the, you know, what is going on? <laughs> so you don't actually know, right? So it's really interesting. And, and I'll tell you an interesting, a funny story there. We had one guy, and it was a classic. We did that study. We go to exhaustion, and then we, and our guy that did the muscle biopsies, Joe Pareto, he was in the hospital across the road, and he kept saying, like, give us an idea of when I've got to come over. Now, the poor guy's a clinician. He's got all these patients and everything, and he'd have to run over and do a muscle biopsy. I, I don't have to thank him more. Was, now I'm further down the road. I have to thank him. He was doing my PhD. So we go, like, where this guy, right? So on average, they've been, like, again, like three hours, see about four hours, come on we had this one guy, he went three hours with the placebo, right? And then, so so Joe Pareto is saying, oh, what time do you think? And I said, well, it should be about, you know, like an hour later. So we're trying to say, oh, it should be about 11.30 or something. So he raced over. The guy just kept going. <laughs> so, so then he went back over. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I think he's getting close. And he came over again. He went five and a half hours. No kidding. He went, wow. He went three hours on placebo, five, and he just kept going. He was like, it was just legendary. But Joe basically, I said, okay, yeah, come over, come over. Because <laughs> you don't want him to like do all that. And then mm -hmm. that was there to the biopsy. Because we we wanted to get not just the glycogen, we wanted to get the, you know, the, the, the you know, creating phosphate, things that change quickly, you know. And um, so we were famous for, we were the quickest, we would get the muscle from when they stopped exercise until it was frozen liquid nitrogen, it was eight to 12 seconds. Wow. So we we're kind of the fast. There's a guy called Larry Spreet from Canada who, Said, I have never seen in all my days anyone that did it as quickly as you guys. So we would practice them. We get them to practice leaning back, putting their leg up on the handlebars before they did the studies. We get them to practice so that they, as soon as they fatigue, they would that, and then their leg wouldn't even be flat on the table, and the needle would almost be in the leg. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you needed to say, you couldn't say, "Oh, Joe, he's finished." You know, it was like you know, trying to cross the road. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's some impressive, uh, some impressive methodology there, for certainly. Uh, but yeah, capturing that immediately kind of pre-exercise window certainly important. Um, I think the biggest thing, kind of that I that I got from what you just said is, and what I found interesting and maybe almost surprising is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I maybe I heard incorrectly, but so during those three hour slash four hour kind of bike rides when they were doing it to exhaustion, at the end of the ride you did you say that the glycogen was the same the glycogen level was the same in both of those conditions so yeah yeah kind of from a muscle yeah. from a muscle energetic or maybe like a muscle energetic perspective the only thing that was different was that they had a higher rate of carbohydrate oxidation when you were giving them the carbs and that was sort of explaining that extra hour exactly. that they got exactly and also there's a guy called um um andy coggan who was he was actually the first one on my podcast he he um oh hang on i just spaced myself out there um, oh, anyway, it doesn't matter. He had a study where he basically showed that the, the, the last hour or whatever, it was almost mm -hmm. entirely glucose, which is pretty amazing because it means you're getting like two grams a minute, which for a while there we would only – oh, anyway, I won't go. <laughs> for a while there we used to think you could only have like one gram a minute, mm -hmm. glucose uptake from drinking, but now you're starting to talk more about two grams a minute. So it actually does fit because you've got to actually take over from the glycogen. And as I said, you were burning about two, two and a half grams a minute. So back then we used to think, hang on, how the glucose couldn't take over because we didn't think you could do, you know, more than a gram a minute. But now there is studies, you know, people are really packing in the, they're giving people like 120 grams an hour drinking, which back in the day we were just like, oh, they'll get GI distress and whatever. So, um, yeah, it, it seems like, so in the, in the, any, I don't know if you have like show, some people have like show notes and whatever on there. I don't do that. Like some people have um, show notes, like a like a blog, and you can add papers and whatever. If you did that, you could see that the glycogen didn't change that extra hour. Then maybe it was happening in the. This is where the purists and everything say, "Well, hang on a minute. That's just a biopsy where you've got the whole muscle. You don't know what's happening in the slow versus the fast mm -hmm. fibers, mm -hmm. and it might be some fibers." Are fatiguing and that's enough to make you stop and whatever so and some people have done those studies but you know this is where we got into that discussion with Jorgen Jansen he's still not convinced 
So um, some people are saying, well, some fibers do deplete. And he's saying, yeah, but when you look at it, it was only like 20% of fibers depleted and all, you know, all this sort of stuff. So we got into sort of the, the minutiae on that. So, yeah, essentially the glucose takes over from the glycogen at the end to keep you going. Yeah. I guess what I, I guess why I find it surprising is that you often hear of you know if you start because I assume you were they were getting these exogenous carbohydrate like at the start of exercise or was it just in that last hour? Uh, every because... 50, no, no, no. It's very important. Every fifteen minutes, that's critical. You, you right. took they took it every fifteen minutes for the whole way. If you do it, if you do it only at the start, totally different ball game. You'll you'll just deplete way earlier. Uh, sorry, you'll you'll run out of um, your liver glycogen will drop. And your glucose will drop, and you will deplete way earlier. Right. If, if um, you wait, if you wait, it'll deplete. Yeah, you're going to take earlier. it throughout because remember, mm-hmm. you're trying to maintain your glucose levels. So if you're if you're just taking it one at the start, it will go up, and then it'll just go down again. Mm-hmm. You've got to keep topping it up, topping it up. Yeah, I guess so, my yeah. question, I guess my question then is why? Um, so why would glycogen deplete at all if you're? Is it just because that the rate that you're providing glucose still can't keep up with the demand of during exercise? You're asking some really good. You're asking some really good questions. But that brings me back to um, one of my first studies in my PhD. It just did my head in. We 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 don't actually know why the muscle does that because it, as you're saying, if it could take it all up and use glucose, why doesn't it? And I've got another one that would do your head in even more than that. Which is, um, you know, we did like high glycogen versus low glycogen, which we'll talk about maybe later in one of my PhDs. So we did high glycogen versus low glycogen. Well, it's high versus kind of like moderate, uh, like normal, slightly low. And it's a full point because we had a lot of trouble getting the glycogen low. We couldn't for the life of us get them low and stay low. So we can talk about that. But anyway, so you do high versus normal or low. And then they were exercising at 65% VO to max, which is the one I said it's like 50 50. And they were using tons more glycogen when they had the high glycogen than when they had the low glycogen. Mm. And it's like, why are you doing that? Because if you could get away with doing it, if you can get away with doing the exercise, so they did 40 minutes, 65% VO to max, they could do it. Right? So why are you wasting that glycogen? So when you have the high glycogen, we know you can do it because you've got the same participants coming in. And riding with high and low glycogen, we know the muscle can get away with it. You know, why are you wasting glycogen? And we, we and others showed that that the higher the glycogen, the more you use at the same workload. It's like that is like stupid. No, I'm saying how smart the body is, unless we're missing something, that is stupid. <laughs> it really is like stupid. So we showed like it was actually a linear relationship. We had like really high normal and low and it was like basically a linear relationship at the same workload so 65 percent vo to max mm. the higher the glycogen the more you used during that 40 minutes of exercise so that's just yeah so i'm actually these are good questions you're asking because um that's there's plenty of questions that we don't have the answer to yet no yeah and I, I guess the question was just because you know you often hear that you know if you take in carbohydrates even early on in exercise you'll it'll have like a glycogen sparing effect but that doesn't seem to kind of be like the case i guess okay all right so if we want to go okay we're getting into the minutia a little bit this is when you're doing this is <laughs> when you're right. doing like 70 percent. no 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 i want to no I'm me going, too me too yeah you're opening the door to it so i'm going to go <laughs> through trust me so okay what we're talking about here is 70 percent vo to max constant workload um, throughout, and it looks like carbohydrate ingestion doesn't really spare glycogen. Again, you might have to say, people say, oh, well, that's slow fibers. Well, basically, essentially, you just do a biopsy, you get a mixed mix sponge. It doesn't deplete it, uh, spare glycogen. We've Others have shown that. So any coil, we've shown it, whatever. Um, it doesn't spare glycogen. But that's 70% constant workload, right? So you might say, well, is that what normally happens in exercise? So what about if you're altering? So a guy, J. Mark Davis, showed that if you did um, intermittent exercise, then you, they, he did get sparing of glycogen. Because basically what happens is, you know, you do the high intensity and then during the recovery, if the insulin is high enough, it kind of pushes it into the into the muscle, you you were actually getting some sparing, mm. right? And they could actually go longer. So he did intermittent exercise to exhaust, which sounds like fun. But, um, yeah, so hard and easy, hard, easy, hard, easy. I can't remember, it was something like, 15 minutes, 15 seconds hard, 45 seconds, you know, rest or whatever. They actually went like an hour when they had no carbohydrate, an hour and a half and they had the carbohydrate, and they actually spared glycogen. So 
I don't know if you could, okay, sparing makes it sound like you're using less, but what it might have been is they, they might have been using it at the same rate, but they were resynthesizing a little bit during the recovery. So um, I don't know that detail. So, and again, like if you're playing soccer or something like that, yeah, you know, I wouldn't confidently say that you're not sparing glycogen if you're drinking carbohydrate. I think you probably are. I mean, it's intermittent. Then you've got your half time break and, you know, all that stuff. If you've got glucose on board and insulin's up because you're drinking carbohydrate, then that will tend to push it into the muscle and maybe spare some glycogen. Yeah. I see. Okay. Because, yeah, I think the sort of just the way that maybe the thinking goes is, you're, you know, if you're drinking, if I have a carbohydrate solution that I'm drinking, basically that will keep my blood glucose elevated. Therefore, I no longer need to use glycogen. But it seems that at least at a certain exercise intensity, that doesn't really matter because That's you're you're going to be drawing totally, from liver and muscle glycogen regardless. Yes, but even that that thing is totally incorrect. So the thing about saying I'm drinking carbohydrate, I won't be using glycogen is totally incorrect. You might be using less. You might be synthesizing more. But you'll definitely be using glycogen. If you're exercising at any sort of decent intensity, you'll need to use glycogen. And um, I mean, I, okay. But then, but then, yeah, it, it, the timing is important. And the other thing is, let's not forget the liver we touched on earlier. So not only are you, you you're not sparing the muscle glycogen. So we have to, you know, say, hang on, we're talking about muscle glycogen. Mm -hmm. Your liver, you are sparing. So I touched on it much earlier, way, probably way before we were, we were ready for it. Um, in that study, we did the double traces. So we had we could see how much was coming from the liver, but we also see how much was coming from the gut. Well, that was a beautiful thing. So even during the first hour, um, basically as soon as that glucose got into the blood, it started to spare the liver. So the liver went, okay. And that's pretty simple because the insulin, when insulin goes up, it inhibits liver glucose output. So um, there's various reasons, but basically when you drink carbohydrate, your insulin will not, it will either not drop as much or it'll even go up a little bit. And that will um, inhibit liver glucose production and it will stimulate muscle glucose uptake. So um, so when we say we're not sparing glycogen, we're not sparing muscle glycogen during that 70%. During 70%, you're absolutely uh, switching, not entirely, but pretty much switching off the liver glycogen. So that's a good thing, right? Because then you might just say you... you you know, you you miss your drink station, or you know, mm. you're just, or you're in nature. You can't, you know, you don't actually have a banana to be or something to actually keep it up. Then that liver can then release glucose because you've spared it; it's still there. The, gly the glycogen is still there, which gets broken down to glucose and gets released into the blood. So you know, it's it's not like it's doing nothing. And and just while you while we're on this point, I've actually thought, and I, I think I even said it in my PhD, but it's just totally total speculation. Because I remember saying to my supervisor, Mark Hargraves, can I speculate a bit more on that? In the, because quite often you'd have the, you'd probably know this as well, quite often you'd have the, the journal article mm -hmm. and then you say, oh, I'll just put that straight in the thesis. And you can't speculate much in the journal articles. So I was like, can I stick that in the thesis and then just add a bit more speculation? And I did speculate at that point, and I don't know if anyone's ever looked at it, that maybe there's a signal from the liver that when you go that four hours to exhaustion and you go, why are they fatigued? Yeah, maybe there's some signal from the liver that that you know is is playing a role in that. The, the, the liver is saying, look, I'm okay, or something, and it affects the performance. But that was just a total speculation. No, I think that there's probably something to that. And actually, so it's interesting because I was I had um, so I don't know if you're familiar with who Zach Bitter is. He's an ultra marathon runner. He formerly held the world record for the 100 mile run um i don't think he know, at long, uh, holds the record anymore but i had him on my podcast um just to talk about endurance training he's famously a low carbohydrate kind of athlete he does periodized carbohydrate intake and things like that but you know we were talking about glycogen depletion obviously on kind of a more surface level but the question came up you know is and as you mentioned i plan to ask you this anyway but you know is glycogen ever fully depleted and the answer to that seems to be no and we were wondering you know what percent you know when do you start to fatigue? Yeah, exactly. and, and it seemed you know based on what we could find it was about around 20 to 40 percent it's kind of when performance starts to drop when glycogen gets around there so th that you know got me thinking like you just mentioned oh there must be some once the, the body can sense this somehow, that glycogen is like running low and it almost kind of has this protective 
mechanism that goes in. I don't know what sort of signals would be released, but well, I'm sure something like that is, is happening. Yeah. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that we didn't know about when I was doing my PhD. So I, mm. my PhD was 1991 and 1995. Now we know about these, um, um myokines, myokines so there's yep. yes but we also know there's exokines so myokines are like proteins but essentially proteins that are released from the muscle so myo is muscle released from the muscle and they affect other organs and go around you know go into the brain and all sorts of things we also know this no now there's things called exokines which are like little little bubbles that are released from the from the muscle and they actually can even contain like dna and rna and all this sort of stuff so it's kind of crazy so that stuff's all going around the place. So, so why couldn't there be like something released from the muscle to say, look, goes to the liver? And also this this hepatokine. So uh hepatic is liver. So you have stuff released from the liver that goes all over the place. You've got everything's just going everywhere now. So it's just got really complicated. So um there's all sorts of signaling going on. So indeed, I just actually had a, a book on exercise metabolism. And um, well, actually that didn't work. <laughs> That's not a good example. That person didn't come through in the end. So I've got a, a, a seventeen chapter exercise, a book on on exercise metabolism, and um, yeah, one of, one of them was meant to be all the organs talking to each other. But basically, that's what you need. That is a missing link in my book, but um, which I wish I hadn't brought up now. So, anyway. but I'm just saying that that is part. So you know how you have a textbook and it's got metabolism, then it's got cardiovascular, it's got respiratory, mm. and then it's got training. Nowadays, you you really need to have a chapter that says inter organ um you know uh, communication because that's oh, yeah. just huge. the crosstalk and everything like that yeah it's cross definitely talk. a new area yeah now that we have metabolomics and proteomics and all that stuff a whole new a whole new realm the omics realm yeah but you still need the physiology i just had michael joiner on i haven't even uploaded it yet and he kept saying people thought when all these omics came along genomics whatever you don't need physiology anymore it's like hello you're going to get a mouse you can knock out its gene but how are you going to know what's happening you put on the treadmill change its diet you need physiology absolutely yeah i'm yeah. looking forward to to hearing your conversation with joiner because he's kind of uh at least what i can gather from twitter he's sometimes skeptical of sort of like the some of the new technologies with like the personalized nutrition and things like that he's always uh he's always a, a bit skeptical of that reasonably so um but he'll I, I like, he's I a like good, him. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah he was on he was on a tia recently and i'm looking forward to your interview with him so Cool. Uh, he's he's amazing. The only trouble was um, I did the pre-chat before we started the real chat, and he it ended up being only at an hour. So it's like, oh crap! There's a whole bunch of stuff I couldn't get through. But it wasn't like he was like he had to take his kids swimming. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just a bit short. But he actually said, "I'm happy to come on again." So yeah, yeah you need like three to four hours with him. That could be a three oh, to four, hour, four hour podcast. Absolutely, <laughs> for sure, absolutely. for sure. But you'd be struggling to get that time with him. <laughs> Definitely. He's a busy guy. I invited him on my podcast at the start of the pandemic. And that was when um, he messaged me back and I was, you know, thankful enough that he messaged me back, but he was just getting started on their um, convalescent plasma study oh my research gosh. studies that they were doing. So I caught we him at a bad time. That. Yeah. That is totally nuts. Cause I yeah. somehow missed all that because, you know, I've basically been out, been out of academia a bit since December, 2020. And I went and looked him up, you know, Google scholar his third biggest, um, Paper now, 819 citations wow. of the Journal of Clinical Investigation, which is mm -hmm. like one of the best journals, mm -hmm. convalescent plasma. And then, it, and then I had a look at 20 papers in the last like, year and a half. <laughs> and it's not even like exercise. It's like, dude, so we talked about it. It's like, holy crap, you know? No, it's not. His his range is remarkable. It's just kind of the 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 areas that he's in and kind of the knowledge and that he has in all those areas. And it, it's incredible. And then he's an anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. He's not even an exercise guy. No. Anyway, anyway, this we're not here to talk about Michael Joyner, but he'll, he'll probably quite happy, <laughs> Yeah, right. Maybe he'll hear this. Uh, but yeah, I, the first thing, in, one more thing on him. But the, I think the first uh, place that I was introduced to him was he had written an article on like the two-hour marathon, maybe even like yes. a, dec a decade or something ago. And so that's kind of how I was first introduced to him. And hey, look, now it happened. So well, guess guess what he did the other day? Uh, about two months ago, he had the one fifty marathon. Uh, is that right wow he's done an upgrade yeah yeah well, it'll happen eventually maybe not in our lifetime but well that was interesting he was talking about like it's one day if we like legalize doping and all that stuff it was, it was like a kind of a fictional sort of thing it's quite interesting yeah. yeah that's right maybe it might have been a different book that i was reading but there was somebody who sort of 
said, you know, if we have ideal conditions and like you legalize doping, you know, let them use EPO, you might be able to get it down to like 147 or, or something ridiculous like oh, that. Man. So who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I was there when he, I was there when he rang. I know we're off on a tangent here, but I was there when Kipchoge rang. Ali had Kipchoge. I feel like he, he's he's earned the you know when people say Kipchoge, he's like this guy is a legend. We call Ali Kipchoge. Yeah, he deserves um, the full name. Yeah. I was there in Vienna when he ran one one fifty nine forty. Were you I was really? There. Wow. I know. I was saying to someone yesterday, it's like the highlights with me, the kids and me get married. But for me, being an up runner, I was just like ballistic. I was just I was thirty meters from the finish, and he went past like six times. Mm -hmm. It was up and down the. I was just like holy crap, and um, so I keep plugging my podcast. But I interviewed Andy Jones, and and I asked Andy Jones, you know, how, how I said he looked like he was cruising. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we actually had him over. He got an honorary doctorate. They gave him an honorary doctorate through Exeter University. And that vice chancellor said, how hard was it? And he said it wasn't. Yeah, and incredible. it sort of looked like he was totally bruising. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's, let's move on. From yeah, for sure. No, I mean, it's all, yeah, we could go on several tangents, but I'll have to listen to the Andy uh, Jones episode. I haven't given that. I'm doing a good of, job of plugging my podcast. <laughs> you are. Hey, your po you... hey, actually, maybe we should plug your podcast. So I listened to the Circadian Rhythm one you had the other day, and I, it was excellent. Because I was okay. like, who, I didn't know who you were, to be honest, just from Twitter. I mean, I've just agreed to that. Maybe it was before I agreed. I mean, who's this guy? And uh, it was really excellent. I, I was really impressed. Good. Good. Yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed that one. I, I enjoyed it as well. Trust me. I, you know, oftentimes I, I do podcasts on things that I know about, but sometimes I'm like learning so much during the podcast themselves. And uh, yeah, D John was, uh, he was an awesome guest. He's doing some, some pretty cool work. So. Which, which could actually be a good thing in a way, like, because sometimes I think, oh, I've got to like study up on this person. And other times I think, you know, like, like we've kind of done today, you, just, you sort of just, you know, you don't actually have to know that much. You just no. sort of ask the right questions, you know? Yeah, and it's easier to easier to prepare for sure. No, and a lot of this I obviously knew with uh, you know the ex phys background and stuff, but um, I'm yeah, also exactly. learning a lot because you're presenting a lot of new and so even like classic studies. Um, so I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna listen to this when we're done and like take notes so I can learn some more. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There so go. one more thing about maybe um, carbohydrate utilization during exercise, and then I want to maybe talk a little bit about training because I think that's interesting as well. And we could get into insulin sensitivity maybe for the for the final part, but. So for carbohydrate ingestion, you know, during exercise, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty clear at this point that, you know, you can improve performance by ingesting carbohydrate before exercise, but does that depend on the length of the exercise? So say, you know, if, if glycogen isn't sort of say a limiting factor, maybe we're just going to exercise for 30, exactly. to, 30 to 45 minutes, does carbohydrate exactly. ingestion have any effect on exercise when it is say 30 well, to 45 minutes or something like that in glycogen exactly. is that a limiting factor all right so that's exactly what i did so in our phd we looked at like two hours three hours whatever and then when i first left and got my first position i i then scaled it back and said well hang on a minute what about if we look at an hour like tons of people are looking at you know carbohydrate loading and carbohydrate ingestion and everything for exercise over an hour and, and essentially it makes no difference because mm. you don't deplete so as you and as you've gone through that thinking process, you go like, okay, glycogen is probably not depleted after an hour. And I'd already said that glucose like stays normal for the first hour. So you sort of go, well, maybe it doesn't make much difference. And, and you know, some people will say, so I know Eddie Coyle again did this 50 minutes of exercise. There was a slight but significant improvement. The stuff we did in an hour, there's no improvement. But, you know, it's, it's an hour is probably about the, the cutoff where it may have some slight effect. It may not. So, and I think that's, that's really important to know because, for example, we have this race. It's the biggest fun, fun run in the world. It's the biggest, you know, um, I don't know if you, do you call it fun runs over there where it's just a, just a 10K or, you know, 14K? We, uh, we call it maybe, fun run. You know, yeah, we don't, have just, fun, we don't have fun ahead of it, but. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> we have, anyway, we have the city to serve. It's 14Ks. It's the biggest. It's like 80,000 people. And, you know, I've done like that nine times. It was my big thing and whatever. And, you know, I used to like try and pack in these drinks and whatever. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I did 45 minutes was my fastest, right? So I, I would be trying to pack in this water and, and, and have a carbohydrate, whatever. It's like, dude, you don't need to. So basically for an hour, mm -hmm. it's, it's not really important. You don't need to carbohydrate load. You don't need to just carbohydrate. So, um, you know, and water, even water. You say, well, yeah. do I really need to drink, you know? And I think if it's hot and it feels better, then, yeah, drink. But it's probably even that's a bit borderline, you know? Obviously if it's hot, then, yeah. 
So yeah, the, the whole thing about do I need to have carbohydrate before, do I need to have it during, do whatever, I think an hour is about the cutoff. You know, some there might be someone you know yelling at the screen now saying, oh, you know, someone showed 40 minutes or whatever, but it's you know, 50 minutes, hour 10, whatever, not really much difference. And we, yeah. we did the you know, we did the traces and the biopsies and whatever, we saw nothing over now. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I would, I'm not the person, you know, screaming at the screen, but I would maybe almost just counter that because I, I feel like there are some studies where say, if they're doing a 30 minute time trial, if I, they eat carbohydrates beforehand or have like a glucose sports drink or something, then their performance will improve. So, I mean, what, what might explain the improvement? I mean, I know a lot of it, maybe it's just perception. Um, you know, if you feel like you, you have more energy before the Hang exercise. On. So I guess I haven't seen these. I have to say, I haven't really so, you know, you said we'll get into insulin sensitivity and everything. I haven't done carbohydrate digestion, carbohydrate loading stuff for like 20 years or something. I'm just surprised by that. So you're saying the studies that show carbohydrate digestion or eating carbohydrate before a 30-minute time trial. Well, I could just be – I don't have any specific studies in mind, so I'm just kind of pulling from the general uh, knowledge maybe that I've read. So I will have to uh, – I'll have to fact-check that statement. But oh, we'll I feel – We'll have a little Twitter exchange later. I'd be interested in that. Is that, that sure, that, sure. That, Pretty much amazes me. Okay. So unless unless they were like fasted for like three days or something, and then you know, and then they gave them something to eat, you know, straight before it or something. But if you just have normal sort of preparation, especially if you've had break, okay. And this is a bit unfair because most studies have been fasted. But if you've had break, yeah, no, I'd be going even fasted. I I don't want to sit on the fence here. I'd be amazed if someone if you fasted overnight. And then you do a 30 minute exercise that that having breakfast or having carbohydrate or anything would make a difference. But I, I I'm happy to be correct. I'm, I'm actually more than happy to be corrected. Mm, so. Yeah, I would I don't I'm sure I'm gonna, you know, definitely look into this. Like you said, we can we can talk about this. I think we both will. I think Twitter we both later. will. <laughs> because I, you know, I what it wouldn't it almost to me wouldn't make sense if I woke up fasted in the morning. And you know, this is just something that I've experienced myself, but okay, overnight fast, so maybe I haven't eaten for 10 hours or whatever. If I say eat 300 to 500 calories of some type of carbohydrate before I go on a 10 mile run or fast before it, I feel like I'm certainly going to and maybe again, maybe this is all psychological. Maybe it's all perceptual, and maybe it has nothing to do yeah, with how I'm actually going to perform. But thing. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I no, would think my performance would improve. But no, sorry, you're actually. It's funny actually you say that because even though I don't think the literature's shown it, and there might be a study there here or there, but I think even if there is like one or two studies, the number of studies have shown no effect. You know, like uh, yeah. forty-five mm-hmm. minutes. Whatever. But then again, I just think you know when I would run these, you know. Races. I never, for the life of me, not have like a couple of bits of toast before me. You know what I mean? Like it just makes sense. So again, whether it's psychological, so maybe it is. See, that would be the difficult thing because how do you do a placebo for that? So right. I guess okay. So if they had a placebo carbohydrate drink, but if they're having like toast or something, but yeah, if you had a placebo, so if they did a study where they had a placebo, artificially sweetened, artificially uh, flavored drink. You know, an hour before, half an hour before, and they did it, and it was well controlled, and whatever, and they, and they did better after thirty minutes. Then I stand correct. I'm, I'm happy to do, happy to, you know, I have no problem. <laughs> yeah, well, we're gonna. I'm just a, surprised. I'm just yeah. surprised. Well, we'll do yeah. a literature search after we're done with this. I'm, we I'm sure not. we will. I'll be right on to it. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay. Well, well, that's very interesting to hear you to hear you say that. Um, because again, and maybe maybe I just haven't read enough of kind of the literature on that. Um, but what make what does make sense is that sort of the um, you know, the hour or whatever, you know, it would help you pass kind of the hour. What about in- would intensity make a difference in that, Glenn? So you know, if we go back to our situation of we're fasted and, or we're going to have breakfast. Would the intensity of the exercise matter? So if I was going to do a 85% of my, say, VO2 heart rate max versus, say, 60%, do you think the carbohydrate ingestion would have any effect in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, okay. So when you're at the higher intensity, you're using more glycogen and also more glucose, but it becomes, you know, the glycogen's this and the glucose is that, you know, mm-hmm. if it's 85%. Um, so, yeah, you might say, well, if you're doing the higher intensity, then you're using more glycogen. So should you glycogen load, for example, if it's like a lower intensity than your, because your glycogen's not going to run out. You know what I mean? So if you're doing the, if it's not really hard, your glycogen's got to But the trouble is, even with that theory, the glycogen won't run out an hour. That's been shown clearly. So people have done one hour time trials, carbohydrate loaded versus not loaded. 
and they don't do any better with the carbohydrate loaded. And then you look at the data and it's like, well, no wonder because I, you know, if I show stuff on this, <laughs> I better not show stuff with my hands because it's going to be a lot of people watching audio. Um, so, you know, the carbohydrate loaded, then you've got higher glycine when you start and then you fatigue, when you finish the hour, you've got like 50% left. Uh, left. Yeah. And then if you do, um, you don't do carbohydrate loaded, you start with less glycogen. Well, let's just make it numbers. So if you're not carbohydrate loaded, you're one hour time trial. You start with like a glycogen of 100%. Yeah. Mm. And, you, and you finish at like 40%. And then if you do, um, if you do the car budget loaded, you start at say 120%. You know, so you've got 20% more, and then you finish at say 50% or 60%. So the point, the point is, neither of them you're getting low. So you know, the, the thing you said, the ultra distance guy, that 20 to 40%, you're not getting down to that level, right? Um, and so at the same token, then you shouldn't really need carbohydrate ingestion because you know you've got so much glycogen that, and that's the main con contribution. Yeah. But then if you're doing lower intensity, then it's even less reason to um to take it in because you're not using it at such a rate now just while we're talking about this if you don't mind i keep i keep thinking about the amazing um difference in glycogen use based on the intensity so one thing we haven't talked about is if you do like a sprint mm -hmm. so if you do like a 400 meter race so the classic thing is you know the wingate test so you do a 30 second sprint i'm not saying people can do 400 meters in 30 seconds but if you do like a 30 second sprint on a bike where you go flat out from the first pedal, you will use almost 50% of your glycogen in 30 seconds. No kidding. Absolutely. So Hermanson showed that in 1968 or something. Um, he showed he showed, he showed uh, glycogen, and ATP, lactate, and all that pre and post 30 second sprint. And we did we did it as well. We were measuring like AMP kinase and things like that. And almost 50% gone in 30 seconds. And then on the other hand, if you're doing 70% VO to max, like we talked about, it takes about an hour or maybe a bit more to use 50%. So, so that's how crazy it gets. And that's where it actually, all right, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but that's that's where you can say, well, how can you spend you use, use that much glycogen? So if you want to ask me that, I'll answer it. Yeah, well, why don't I go ahead and ask you that then? Yeah, how okay, how, in, how in 30 seconds are we using that much glycogen? All right, so this is a beautiful thing. So if people are still with us, they'll remember back then, but I better say it again, that when you break down glycogen aerobically, you get about 36 ATP. Um, well, okay, 37 ATP aerobically um, when you break down glycogen. And when you break down glucose, you get 36. Remember that discussion? Mm -hmm. I guess it's just slightly different. You say, well, who, why does that matter? But when you're doing anaerobically, so if you're doing mainly anaerobic, so when you're not using oxygen and you're breaking it down very quickly, then when you break it down anaerobically, you get three glyc ATP from every glycogen. You only get two from every glucose. Okay? So if you think about it, in the 30-second sprint, so I don't know if people understand this, but it's mainly anaerobic. Right? It's not entirely anaerobic. It's probably about 80% anaerobic. So you're breaking down all that glycogen and you're hardly touching your glucose. You don't have time to take out the glucose from the blood and break it down. More. So you're breaking all, breaking down off carbohydrate. It's almost entirely glycogen. And, and of that glycogen, you're only getting 3 ATP from every glycogen instead of 37, right? So you go through it like at a great rate. So you can imagine... Right back to your initial thing, how quickly do you need the energy? So when you get up and walk, you need energy faster than when you're sitting. So now you've got energy that you need at a massive rate doing a 30-second sprint. Not only do you need it at a massive rate, but you're using almost entirely glycogen for your energy. You're using creatine phosphate, but I don't think people might be confused about that. You're using a bucket load of glycogen, but you're actually using a lot of creatine phosphate, but let's just not worry about that for a minute. You're going from using glycogen at a slow rate, no, that's just for an hour or two hours or whatever. You're using it at a massively high rate, and you're only getting three ATP for every glycogen instead of 37. Right. So that's how you can use an absolute S load. Right, because we have to break down, I mean, you know, almost you know, it's 15 fold less, you know, the ATP that you're getting from a glycogen 
versus a yes. glucose. So you have to just break down an insane amount of glycogen, essentially. Yeah, I, I, I managed to confuse the issue there. Let's forget about the um, glucose and glycogen bit, that slight difference. What I was saying is the reason when you're going fast, you tend to use glycogen is you're getting three ATP from glycogen and only two from glucose, and you don't have to take it up. Mm -hmm. But let's just set that to one side. Forget glucose. So now if we just think about glycogen. So if you're going slow for an hour, you're using glycogen, you're getting 36 ATP for every glycogen. Now, so forget glucose, 36 ATP. Now you're going flat stick as fast as you can. You're only getting three from every glycogen. So you, as you said, you're using 12 times more glycogen, right? Um, but you're also using it at a much higher rate. So 12 times per glycogen, mm -hmm. but you're using much more glycogen. So just say, you, right? yeah, just say you're using glycogen at, I don't know, like, you know, 100 per minute or something. You're now using it at 1,000 per minute. And each one you're breaking down, you're only getting 12th as much ATP. So hopefully that makes sense to you and the listeners that you go through an ad flu. No, it does make sense. And I just, the number is incredible. Just like, you it's know, when you stop, 30 seconds, you can deplete ha in, you know, almost half of it, but you can last an hour if you de decrease your intensity to just like 70%. I mean, that's such like a drastic gap that, you know, that's not something that I had ever heard, but that's so, it's so interesting to learn that. Yeah, it's really interesting. So same, so there's literally studies that are from Scandinavia in the, in the 60s. I don't know how, I worked it out. I think each subject had 16 muscle biopsies. <laughs> so because they did, they all came in, they had a biopsy, and then they did like 30% VO2 max for like five hours, and they did a biopsy like every hour. <laughs> and then they got them to come in and do 60% VO2 max, they did a biopsy every hour. And they did like 90% VO2 max a biopsy every hour. The same participants, you know. And you see the glycogen, again, I keep showing people who are not watching it on video. Um, so, the, you know, the rate is very slow, 30%. You're you know, as we touched on earlier, you're bur barely burning glycogen or you're burning any fat. And um, so it takes forever to go down. And then at 60%, it takes, you know, it goes down moderately. And then they did, I think they did 90%. So that was like, you know, just, um, so it went down really quickly. And obviously they fatigue quicker and all that stuff, you yeah. know. Yeah, no, super, very, super fascinating there. A um, couple more questions that I wanted to ask just regarding the carbohydrates. Um, and this is kind of the effects of training. So, you know, we, we've we talked a lot sort of about performance and, and things like that, but in general, so if we have, you know, a trained athlete versus just kind of a normal, we, we, uh, we said we weren't going to use that phrase normal, uh, normal <laughs> yeah, at yeah, the beginning. Yeah. I know I did. Untrained. It. An untrained Person. individual. Um how does kind of their training influence their ability to use glucose and glycogen during exercise is, you know, trained individuals I've, I've heard, and maybe even seen some studies where they're obviously kind of better, better at burning fat. They're fat adapted, whether that, you know, due to, you know, upregulating enzymes and things like that. So are they able to um, exercise at a higher intensity while burning fat? And, you know, in that case, are they, are they more efficient at burning kind of both? I would assume yes, um, but we hear this term metabolic flexibility. So um, whether there's any uh, legitimacy to that term, maybe you can you can tell mm -hmm. me or what you think metabolic flexibility might be, but what's kind of the difference between a, uh, an untrained person and a trained person in their rates of yeah. glucose, glycogen utilization during exercise? Yeah, yeah. So tra training, so you, your audience probably might, might know a term called homeostasis, yeah? Mm -hmm. So homeostasis is it's kind of like a state of Try to maintain things. So, so you know, if we just step back a bit, so you, you know, you, you sound like a good runner. You go for a run with somebody who's not fit. The the, the 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 challenge to their homeostasis is much bigger. So they have to breathe more. Their heart rate is higher. So basically, you're you're keeping more of a stable home, right? Mm -hmm. them. Well, it's the same with metabolism. So when you're exercising, you you've got this ATP ADP ratio. So you know when you break down your ATP to ADP and you use that energy, you're able to like keep that coupled tighter. You don't have as much of a uh, of a mismatch of your energy levels and your muscle and things like that. Everything's like nice and tight. And essentially, you don't turn on these pathways that are going to break down glycogen and everything as much. You're able to burn the fat. Yeah. So so when you're trained, you have less basically less of a perpetuation to your to your you know muscles, your your heart, everything. Everything's like just easier. So 
basically the pathways it turned on are less, so you use more fat at the same absolute intensity. So if we talk about absolute first, because absolute means the same exact workload. Right? So if you're running with your mate who's not as fit, or if you're both riding at 100 watts, mm -hmm. so it's the same absolute intensity. Obviously, your mate has to be the same body weight and everything else. Um, you know, running. <laughs> so if you're doing the same absolute intensity, you'll use more fat, trained person, less glycogen, and less glucose. Right? So it's a beautiful thing. So, you know, we, we, I think we've made clear that carbohydrates, well, okay, I know you've got some people have other views about carbohydrate, but you know most evidence suggests that carbohydrate is pretty important if you're going at any sort of decent intensity. You know, maybe if you're doing ultra, 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 then you can burn fat because it's a low intensity, right? But so basically, we, I think we've agreed that glycogen and glucose are important. You know, if your glycogen runs out, you tend to, to, to fatigue. If you're drinking carbohydrate, you can tend to go longer, all that sort of stuff. So when you're endurance trained. So we have to say that endurance strain, not chain, mm -hmm. endurance sure. strain. Then you've got more fat oxidation enzymes in your muscle. So you can burn more fat and use less glycogen, less glucose. So if we talked about those studies where you do the biopsies and the rate of glycogen breakdown, it would be less in the trained person than the untrained person, largely because they're using more fat. And it's changes in the muscle, but it's also hormonal things. Like I talked about if a line jumps out, your adrenaline goes through the roof, whatever. Adrenaline stimulates glycogen breakdown. And, and when you're exercising with your mate, his adrenaline will be higher than yours. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, you know, because he's got to have this heart pumping and you know, right. everything's hard. Yeah? So, yeah, that's that's definitely a, a glycogen and glucose sparing effect. And, indeed, they can go longer and they can go at a higher intensity. Their maximum fat, which I heard you said maximum fat, they can actually burn a higher maximum fat and also at a higher intensity. So you know how we said when you go from 25 to 65 to 85, your fat oxidation goes up from 25 to 65, and then that point actually made it down there. And then it drops down again beyond 65. Well, with the trained person, they can like switch it there. They're, like the untrained person, their maximum fat oxidation might be at 40% of the attacks. Mm -hmm. The trained person is going to be at 65 yeah I so, mean, i've even seen some studies where it's maybe as high as like 70 i think there was a study on athletes who were this was in um i think they were like keto adapted athletes so they were habitually consuming like a ketogenic diet and their their max fat with oxidation was around 70 75 percent I, so. I could definitely see that yeah so the the um so that's the yeah so if you want to talk about the absolute and relative because that gets really interesting because when you're talking about Remember how I said absolute, so it's the same workload. But when we're talking about 65% VO to max or 70% VO to max, that's the, that's the same relative workload. Right. And that's a beautiful thing because that means you're a endurance trained person. If, if their maximum fat use is 65 or 70% VO to max, that's a much higher absolute workload, right? Because for them to exercise at 65% of their max is obviously a higher workload. So they're actually not only burning, so the untrained person is burning their maximum fat is at 40%, and that's a low workload. Mm -hmm. The trained people are at 65 or 70, and that's like a much higher workload. So it means their maximum fat oxidation might be at, it's like the untrained person might be at 100 watts. The trained person might be at 300 watts. Right. You know, so it's a massive difference. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that would explain kind of a lot of the, yeah, like you just mentioned, I guess they're just ability to to exercise high at a higher workload and and for longer than than the untrained person. Um, all right, so I do want to be you know conscious of kind of the time here, and we haven't gotten to uh, insulin sensitivity yet. So I do want to talk about that before we um, you know end end today, because um, that's an area where you've also done kind of a lot of research. Um, so we can split this up into kind of two ways, you know, how does, how does acute exercise influence insulin sensitivity and then how chronic exercise training may influence it. Um, mm -hmm. Before we maybe talk about either of those, maybe it's pertinent to just discuss what it means when we say insulin sensitivity, you know, what's going on in, yes. in the muscle, you know, 
we, maybe people probably know what insulin does. We've mentioned it maybe a few times. It helps increase uh, yeah, glucose, yeah. Glu glucose uptake into the muscle. But, um, you know, when we say somebody is insulin sensitive or we're improving insulin sensitivity, what does that mean in terms of the muscle? Yeah. So, yeah, we, okay, we step back a bit because I knew, I knew when I said insulin, we hadn't really talked about properly. Mm -hmm. So basically, if we, if we even step back further, so you have a meal, assuming there's carbohydrate in it, which I, I hope there's a little bit of carbohydrate in it at least, um, then that glucose goes in the blood, raises the glucose levels, that stimulates the pancreas. It's a bit more complicated again, but basically the pancreas releases insulin because it's trying to, um, you know, counter-regulate, you know, get it back down again. So the glucose goes up, insulin is released, Insulin stimulates the glucose uptake by the muscle, the fat, the liver. Muscle's the major site, glucose disposal. So we're talking there about insulin-stimulated glucose uptake, okay, which is very different. We haven't talked about this to contraction stimulation. Mm -hmm. Contraction is totally different. You don't need insulin, okay? So so you have your, um, your meal and that glucose. Now, then you say, okay, well, if we measured, so just say you have a meal, you have the same meal. Glucose goes up, comes down. If if you have a lot of glucose uptake for the same level of insulin, then that means you're insulin sensitive. Okay, because that insulin is stimulating your muscles to take up glucose. If your if your insulin goes up and the glucose uptake doesn't go up that much, then you're not very insulin sensitive, right? And the other way people get confused sometimes because I may skip around a bit and say insulin sensitivity and insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. And that's what confuses people. But it's the same thing. It's just the inverse. So if you if you're say so you run a lot, so you should be insulin sensitive, right? So that means you have low insulin resistance. Okay. So resistance means insulin resistance means you release the insulin and your body's resistant to it. It doesn't respond to it. Right. Insulin sensitivity means you release the insulin and the body is sensitive to it. It's the same thing. Right. You so want to you want to improve your insulin sensitivity. You want to decrease your insulin resistance. Perfect. Right. Yep. So what you have therefore is you know you start thinking about people with diabetes. Okay. So again, we should say type two diabetes, which is mm -hmm. the more tends to be obesity, a bit older in age and whatever. So that's you know and sedentary lifestyles and things like that. So what happens there, right, is that they have the meal, the glucose gets absorbed, goes in the blood, the liver actually um, the pancreas releases the insulin. That they they are insulin resistant. They don't have good insulin sensitivity. So then, especially their muscle, but also the liver and the fat. But the muscle is the biggest by volume. It takes up the most glucose. The muscle is insulin resistant. Has low insulin sensitivity. So it doesn't take up the glucose properly. So this, the glucose stays elevated. And what it actually means is that you have to start releasing more insulin. This is what confuses people. When you say diabetic, they think, oh, they haven't got the insulin. Right. No, that's not. If it's a type 1 diabetic, they don't produce their own insulin. They need to inject it. Type 2 diabetic or someone that's obese and is becoming insulin resistant and may end up diabetic, they actually have to release more insulin. Mm -hmm. So to get the same response, they actually have higher insulin. And then eventually the, muscle, the, the pancreas may burn out. And then, and by that time, they've often got other problems like high blood pressure and whatever. Then they might need insulin. Basically, what happens with obese, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people with obesity, people with type 2 diabetes, they release the glucose. The glucose is not taken up properly, and they are therefore insulin resistant. They have low insulin sensitivity. And we know that exercise improves that. And how does exercise improve that? So this isn't really something that I maybe have given much thought to until now, but, you know, you mentioned earlier, so insulin can stimulate glucose uptake in the muscle, but so can exercise and exercise does that in this insulin independent way. So contraction kind of mediated glucose uptake, but so how does, ins how does exercise then improve insulin sensitivity? If it's yeah, improving, it's if it improves glucose in an insulin independent, uh, or I know, uptake I, in insulin independent way. Trust me, this has been my, the bane of my existence <laughs> because trying to write grants and explain that and, and what makes it worse in a way is I have a track record in both. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a track record in what regulates glucose uptake during exercise and the fact that it's not insulin oil. And I'm trying to get that in to show that I've got expertise in the area oil. But I'm also trying to say that the insulin stimulated is, is not contraction dependent. So they, okay, I get that now. But then I'm saying how exercise increases insulin sensitivity. And it's like, I thought you said it was independent. You know, so it's, um, 
it's a bit of a nightmare and, and I think half the time they give up halfway through the grant or something so um but um, you know you're trying to get funded to actually do the studies so yeah basically um what happens is is that when you do the exercise even though the contraction itself is not you know the glucose uptake is insulin independent um the, the muscle then becomes more insulin sensitive so you have these pathways that are turned on that that then mean that you're more responsive when the insulin comes along now i i to, I, to do this properly i do need to explain a few things okay so yeah, go ahead there's a transporter so if you imagine this is a muscle okay i can't okay i can't assume people are watching on the screen so you, you can do it little, you can do it for me you can do it for me it helps me as well i'm putting so. my finger up and it's like a little circle it's just a circle, right? <laughs> with my uh, anyway um my thumb and my forefinger it's a circle right so you imagine it's just a circle of the cell now, within the cell, there's these things called vesicles, which are like, just they've got stuff in them, right? And part of what they've got is these things called glucose transporters. And the main glucose transporter in muscle is, is called GLUT4, glucose transporter number four. Now, it's GLUT4, glucose transporter. When you contract, there's all sorts of signaling that goes on in the muscle. We probably won't get to it now, but I've done a whole bunch of stuff on, you know, is it what's causing the GLUT4? So you get the signal, and the GLUT4 moves the membrane, and starts bringing in glucose. So I've done a whole bunch of, you know, is it, is it apicinase, is it nitric oxide, is it calcium? But, so we probably won't get into that now. So the glucose transporter moves to the membrane, brings in the glucose. That's contraction stimulated glucose uptake. You do not need insulin for that. Right. Now, forget that. So you and I get up and we have, you know, something with carbohydrate, you know, heaven forbid, and then, <laughs> then you get the insulin released. Well, that causes the GLUT4 to move the membrane, but the signaling, so the insulin binds the receptors on the cell, causes different enzymes, different signaling, causes the GLUT4 to move the membrane, okay? So these are two separate things. So you, so that's good? You with, with that? Yeah, yeah so yeah. different the different pathways, so the pathway stimulated by exercise may be different from that that is stimulated by insulin, and I'm sure you're going to... It is different. I'm sure and that you're going to go in... Yeah, and but I'm sure you're going to go into why then it improves it. Is it due to more exactly. glute four transporters, more vesicles? Uh, and... Yeah, okay. So, so they they are different, and indeed they're, they're actually additive. So if you have if you contract and then you add and you have contract with insulin, they're mm. additive, right? So that so so that, but it means they add on to each other. So anyway, so we step away from that for a minute. So we know in our back pocket that that. Contraction causes glute four to move in the membrane. Different enzyme, different regulations. Insulin does. So now you've done exercise. So what what we did, I think, is a beautiful study. So I collaborated with people in Copenhagen because what I can do in Australia is we do we put a catheter in the femoral artery in the femoral vein, and we can measure glucose uptake. So we know the blood flow in the femoral artery. We know the glucose concentration in the femoral artery. So the artery is taking the blood away from the heart, so into the leg. And then we have the a, a catheter in the veins so we can see what's coming back. So we can work out how much glucose was taken up in that leg, and we can do muscle biopsies on that leg, and we can do all sorts of things. But um, I never tried doing two legs, but in Copenhagen, we were able to do both legs. So we had femoral artery and femoral vein in both legs, and biopsying both legs. And we, what we did is we exercised one leg. So so we did one legged, it's called leg kicking, leg kicking, but you know it's basically, if you think about like maybe cycling one leg or something, mm. Uh, and then the other leg rests, right? So only one leg is exercised. And then you wait four hours for that initial effects of the contraction to wear off because the glucose uptake remains a little bit elevated. After four hours, it's back to basal. So you've got this beautiful situation. And then one person, you've got the same hormones, same everything, same everything. And you've got one leg exercised, one hasn't. They've both got the same glucose uptake. And then four hours later, you infuse you know, glucose and insulin, or you can have a meal, whatever, and you look at how much glucose uptake is used by the previous exercise leg and how much by the rested leg when they've got the same glucose going through both legs, the same insulin, and the glucose uptake is about 50% or more higher in the previously exercised leg. So that, by definition, for the same insulin, you have higher glucose uptake means you're more insulin sensitive. Um, and that's a beautiful thing. And then what we did, so I went to Copenhagen. I think I said that. I, mean, we went to, I went to Copenhagen. I've had a five-week stay and then two six-month stays, and I'm very pleased to say, even though I took this package and left the university, 
I have six months more and they know my situation. They said, oh, we hope you come. So I have six months more funding for the Danish Diabetes Academy to go and do another six months next year to actually try and work out what's regulating all this stuff. And, and we've got some pretty good ideas about that. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. And, you know, you mentioned earlier that we probably wouldn't get to get into all the mechanisms. I had at one point kind of planned to ask you about that, but maybe uh, maybe we'll do a deeper dive on a round two or something about the the molecular kind of mechanisms uh, responsible for the for the insulin uptake. Maybe, but... maybe I'll just tell you a little tiny bit. All right? So what everyone had done up till now is they all, they all assumed it was the signaling in the muscle, so that the insulin signaling is whatever, but they kept finding it's no different. So when you have the biopsy, the... You measure the enzymes, how activated they are. It's no different in the trained and untrained legs, but the trained legs taking up much more. So, mm-hmm. so my big thing was I was into nitric oxide, which is like a dilator, mm-hmm. causes increased blood flow. So I went over there and we infused a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor. So we we prevented the blood flow effect. So when you have, so I think you're listening to something interesting in this. When you exercise, not only do you get a greater glucose uptake in the muscle, but you actually get a greater blood flow. So you get this insulin-dependent blood flow effect, right? So insulin actually causes dilation of vessels. Mm -hmm. So what happens, we show, is that when we blocked the blood flow effect, we could prevent it. So basically, the reason you have greater glucose uptake in your uh, sorry if I push because you wanted to move on. I was like, no, we're doing this. <laughs> no, it's all good. I love I love going down these kind of rabbit holes. So Yeah, exactly. But you're no trying problem. to run the show here. No problem yeah, okay. at all. No problem. Um, so what, what we know is it's both. So mm-hmm. the signaling is turned on. So that leg, four hours later, it's insulin signaling is ready to go. But it's not, and you, you haven't got the glucose delivery, the insulin, the blood flow. So it's just sitting there, like ready to go, but nothing's happening. Then when you have the meal or you have the infused glucose and insulin, now you've got, you know, the signaling is already on, so it's like showtime. So it starts taking up the glucose. And part of it is the blood flow delivery. So if you block that, which is what we did by giving the inhibitor, then you prevented that. So it was the same as the untrained leg. So you actually need the signaling and you need the blood flow. And I think yeah. you showed that pretty nicely. Yeah, yeah that definitely um... – that definitely makes sense, but it, you know, also the, I think it's a lesser known kind of effect that insulin does stimulate like the, the blood flow to the muscle. So, which exactly makes sense right. because I mean, where, where you have demand in the muscle, where you have, you know, contraction, you're going to one need fuel, you know, you're going to need to uptake the blood glucose to provide energy, but then you're going to need blood to deliver, you know, the glucose to exactly the muscle right. actually. So, you know, it kind of makes sense that yeah. insulin has all these actions, you know, it's way more than just a, a, a blood glucose kind of regulating hormone. Exactly. And, and it was a beautiful thing because we had this thing called contrast enhanced ultrasound, which they had set up there. So we weren't just measuring the leg blood flow, but we'd actually infuse these little micro bubbles. And as they went through the muscle, we'd hit them with ultrasound and they'd blow up. And then you could see them come back in again. Mm-hmm. So we're actually able to work out the muscle blood flow. And that's a really amazing thing because if you do low, if you do like low contraction, like just they like literally like hand waving, like really low intensity. There's no change in your total blood flow in the arm, but there's an increase in the muscle blood flow. And the same if you do like insulin. If you have like low dose insulin, there's no increase in your total blood flow, but there's more through the arm. So it's called the it's called nutritive flow or capillary flow, where you're actually sending it through the nutritive beds rather than like through the tendons and all that stuff. So um, you know, the connective tissue. So that's really interesting. So we were able to do that as well. We actually had seven catheters. So femoral artery, femoral vein in both legs, plus two and two in one arm and one on the other arm. So we're infusing micro bubbles and it was it was nuts. Plus um six biopsies, three on each leg. So that was fairly invasive. After a while I'm like, why don't we stick something in the juggler or something? Because it, it's know, like everything was why down not, there. Why not, right? Why not, right? Yeah. yeah, everything was down there and the upper body was like, you know, the, the, and they've actually done that in Copenhagen. They've actually done jugular. They looked at what was being released from the brain. They stuck a cat in the jug. So, I'm serious. I'm like, why don't we stick it in there? Okay. No, that, yeah, that's fascinating too because you want to know, I mean, in, increasing brain blood flow, I think, is one of the a pretty potent effective exercise as well. And, you know, the brain, yeah. quite an important organ. So studying that I think would be effect, uh, effective. But I love how you're studying all these studies. And I'm going to include, you know, hopefully as many as I can in like the show notes. Like you mentioned, I do have show notes for people. So hopefully, oh, you, you do know, have show yeah, notes. yeah. So you right. can send me the papers and we can put some graphs in there. And I think that will hopefully help, uh, you know, people. Well, that's that's what I've, got, I've that been, you're describing. 
I've got to talk to you about that on the side or something because I that is one thing I haven't I haven't got a blog or website set up. I'm just like, holy crap. You know, it's been such a steep learning curve. And that's what you need. You need to, instead of I can actually say, oh, you can see this figure by so and so in the show notes. Yeah. No, it certainly helps. You get it's kind of a follow along type of thing. They can download the show notes and, and follow along. Yeah, and you can expand on stuff and this is stuff, you know, if you could follow up about the the 30 minutes of exercise, you know, whether it's improves or not. <laughs> exactly. You can, it's a yeah, you, we can put in we can fact check ourselves. So, and... You don't look so bad, man. You don't look so bad. No, I, I'm happy <laughs> to say I might have I might have it wrong in a minute. I might have yeah. it wrong as well. So we'll uh that's a follow-up from this. Um and neither so, of us cares, right? You just want to know the truth. No, know. exactly. That's what we're all about. <laughs> that's what we're all about. Exactly. Regarding the insulin sensitivity, uh just the effects of exercise. So a, a, both acute exercise and training improve insulin sensitivity, but you know, how long after like an exercise bout, you maybe mentioned something about four hours, but say we just do an hour of exercise or whatever, for for how long kind of does the muscle stay quote insulin right. insulin sensitive after that? All right, all right. So we'll clarify. So what happens? The reason we wait four hours is because see, we do the hour of exercise, mm -hmm. right? And then we they don't eat. So that glucose uptake after it that is just the the the, the resid, residual high glucose uptake. This is not insulin. We don't do any insulin. So then four hours later, we we hit them with the insulin, whether it's a what's called a clamp, we infuse glucose and insulin, or they have a meal. So we that's a follow up. We're doing a meal. Um, the Okay, so the answer to your question is 24 to 48 hours, maybe even more, your muscle remains more insulin sensitive. So, you know, if you um, you know, if you did, if you got them back in instead of four hours later, you got them back in the next day, it would still be higher than that, mm -hmm. that previously exercised leg. And, and the good way is I've actually, this is a whole other story because I've moved away from what's meant to be the gold standard is like infusing glucose and insulin. I've totally moved away from that. I think it's so non-physiological because you clamp it at five millimoles just your normal glucose concentration mm -hmm. it doesn't happen after a meal it goes up whatever so you, everything's just so non-physiological and you give it peripherally so you bypass the liver and everything so we've i've pushed hard and we ended up doing a meal a follow-up where we did all the catheters and stuff with a meal um but basically what i'm getting at there is a lot of studies will do things like an oral glucose tolerance test where you drink like 75 grams of glucose totally non-physiological <laughs> when do you ever do that in nature um, so all these oral glucose tolerance tests, clamps and things, I'm actually moving away saying, let's look more closely at the continuous glucose, continuous glucose monitoring stuff. We actually have, you know, you follow them for 24 hours and whatever. And yeah, it's clear, like 24 hours, 48 hours, you will have over your normal day with your normal meals and everything, you will have less glucose excursions mm -hmm. when you have the exercise beforehand. So again, you've got to look at the insulin and then say, well, you know, we can't assume the insulin's the same. But basically, the insulin sensitivity is greater for 24 to 48 hours. Sure. You're After one a, about, right, yeah. you're going to have a lower area under the curve if you like calculated that for say 24, 48 hours. Um, exactly right. Which I think is better than a snapshot, like doing an oral glucose oh, tolerance test sure. the next day. Yeah. For sure, I I agree, and I think maybe maybe that was an episode of your podcast I was listening to where you kind of railed against the. 75 gram glucose bolus which i agree i mean it's it's you know when when is anybody ever just drinking 75 grams of straight glucose i mean it's not <laughs> it's not that interesting to see how you well, know, your body responds to that and exactly. I mean, it's, yeah it's way more interesting to it's say the same with the let's give it's the same with the glycemic so just while we're busy pissing people off it's the same with the glycemic index stuff because <laughs> uh -huh. glycemic index you're looking at the response to 50 grams but of carbohydrate but again it, people get confused about this so you might have pasta and you know you've ate 100 grams 50 grams of it is cut up you know what i mean but the point is you never just have pasta we never just have so when you say oh potato has this and pasta has this and glucose has this you never just have them on their own you're always having a mixture of stuff and that changes it and as soon as you have the potato and put like a slightest little dob of butter on it you've slowed down the, the emptying you've infected the glycemic index so I think it's better to get into these meal tests, which people are doing now. Um, but anyway, so the bottom line to your question was 24 to 48 hours after one bout of exercise. And then with training, training is a funny one because training is essentially a bunch of acute exercise bouts, mm -hmm. right? So you'll see the, the glucose transporters, the glucose four and things, they'll go up and they'll come down, then they go up and then the signal to, now all the stuff that it's like a, 
bunch of separate belts. And then they kind of add on a little bit. But a lot of it is kind of like the effect of the last belt of the exercise. So that's where it gets hard to, to compare because you go, oh, well, hang on, was that the last belt of exercise or was it the training effect? But essentially, you do get an added add, add on. So you actually made an astute little comment before that I heard, which was the glute four. So with training, you get an increase in your glute four transporters. So you actually have more glute four on the membrane. Oh, sorry, you have more GLUT4, so more GLUT4 can translocate in response to insulin and bring in glucose, yeah. So, um, yeah, so in terms of how long it lasts, it lasts, you know, a, a bit longer, but again, it's probably like instead of 24 to 48, it might be, you know, 48 to 72 or maybe a bit longer. It's, you need that last, but you've got to keep doing it, basically. Yeah, no, that's very interesting because, you know, you say – you know, we would say, oh, an exercise trained person, they're they're much more insulin sensitive, but you know, how much of that is just due to like the last bout? And that was a question I was going to ask you, like, you know, when you stop training, how long does it take for insulin resistance or, you know, a reduction in insulin sensitivity? And it seems like that's it's a good question. Yeah. Fairly, fairly short period of time. Like, that's a good I mean, question. I, you know, I know they do the bed rest studies where it's like you lay in a bed for a week and everything goes haywire, but, um, you know, it seems like Absolutely. within 48 hours, maybe you're kind of insulin sensitivity. Yeah, I'm probably down. a bit longer than that. If you train, if you mm -hmm. train, I reckon you'd still be five days. To be honest, I don't know the exact papers or whatever. I reckon still five or six days, you'd probably still be a bit up. I think yeah, yeah. Do. But again, bed rest, see? I mean, again, you go bed rest. And you go, well, how physiological is that? Sure, <laughs> sure. So, you know what I mean? So sometimes I think they design the studies. I don't want to piss off. I've had a previous guy on who is the most famous bread rest study of all time, so I don't want to piss him off. But um, yeah, but he said, "Oh, that was actually more to simulate, um, you know, um, space travel." But you know, people don't think like that. They go, "Oh, I get bed rest." So yeah, that's the thing. Quite often, people the models are kind of exaggerate the findings. So I know we had another area of mine that we may not get to, which was the um, the effect of you know your. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a whole other bunch of stuff, which is developmental stuff. Um, mm -hmm. How, like, if your if your mother exercises or if your father's on a bad diet, whatever, how it causes you to have more diabetes later in life, and how exercise can overcome that. But again, some of those models they use, uh, especially in rat studies, are just totally non physiological. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes just to illustrate a concept, you sort of have to take models to the extreme. Um, yeah. Even as long as you bring it back. Yes. As long as you then bring it back, and that doesn't always happen. So, for example, 99% of all studies in rats and mice, I would suggest we can't really um, hold. Uh, sorry, I'm not a, I'm not an anti-rat and mice. I've done a whole bat, bunch of rat and mice studies. But what I'm saying is 99% of them were done with rats just sitting in cages where they were totally, absolutely, non-physiologically inactive. Rats and mice will run 8 to 10 kilometres a day, and they are that big. Well, okay, I'm showing. A mouse is tiny. A mouse is tiny, it will run eight to ten kilometers a day. But every almost every study ever done, whether it's whether it's um, you know, diets, um, medications, you know, how does how does like a drug uh, uh, a blood pressure medication work or whatever, uh, they've done on mice and rats sitting in a cage, non-physiologically sedentary. It's like being in an Austrian dungeon or something. Mm -hmm. You know, these horrible cases where people have been, you know, locked away for years. That that's the equivalent. Is that relevant? So, you know, what you should really do is have a a, a, um, a, a wheel. So they, if you put a running wheel in there, they all run 8 to 10 kilometres a day. I've done these studies. So that's your normal mouse. That's your normal rat. Now try the blood pressure medication. Don't, do it, don't give it to one that's locked in an Austrian dungeon. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> I haven't yeah. seen rat pet vibes, but that's one of them. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where that's one place where rats are different than humans. Because if you put a treadmill next to a human, they're not going to just run eight to ten <laughs> kilometers per day, are they? <laughs> that's exactly right. And then you uh, then you actually even that gets more complicated because you say because we make out that's a normal mouse, mm -hmm. but it might be because they're actually nuts. You know, they're in this cage, locked up, very stressed, and maybe they're running to try and like you know to actually reduce their anxiety. So, wow, yeah, that's a good point. That that um. That kind of brings up a similar thing to, you know, you I maybe you've heard about these studies or whatever where they have it's they talk about the rats getting addicted to cocaine and you know they'll take the 
maybe sugar over the cocaine or it, it was about like rat addiction to drugs or something yeah, like but that. Yeah, that might just be nuts. Yeah, exactly. But they don't they don't get addicted if you put they only got addicted to these drugs or addicted to sugar if you put them in this environment where there was nothing that was stimulating. But if you put them in like this oh. environment where they could do things, you know, they didn't get addicted to the drug. So maybe similar to the treadmill thing. I mean, if I'm in, alone in a box and all I have is a <laughs> treadmill, well, I'm going to run on the treadmill. Or it's like that, yeah. or the or the you know the study where they put the people in the room with a shock they could shock themselves and they just leave them there yes. for like f five hours and they're so bored that they just like sh keep shocking themselves even though it's painful. So, well, you know, then, you then, know another example. No, you know another example is how often do you hear like people are in prison? Yeah, the they keep saying as they work out and whatever, right? Yeah. So yeah, you have to do something to to stimulate the body some way, mentally, physically, anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, right. Glenn. So I definitely, you know, I had a lot of other topics, and I don't want to, you know, over kind of load people. We got into a lot of the basics that I really wanted to cover, and we did, you know, I think a great job of doing deep dives on a lot of this stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to end just with maybe one listener question that I had on Twitter. Somebody wanted me ah. to ask you about your your first AMPK and exercise paper. I think that would be maybe a good place to end. Just you uh, describing that. I have to admit that I I haven't read the paper, so I'm not quite sure. But they said no, that's all right. You know, now nah, this so, guy, I have to give this guy a bit of a plug. Is Jeff Jeff Rothschild? He's a bit, yeah, I'm so, familiar with he's Jeff. Been really but... good. Yeah, when I started my um, podcast, he was he was literally like a sounding board. And whatever, he's been great. So he's uh, he always like sends questions. So um, yeah, from New Zealand, PhD student. Um, yeah, so that's a good good question. But I guess we haven't really gone into it. That's partly why I threw in the aim. Okay, so when you when you look about when you talk about glucose uptake during exercise, again, you start thinking about mechanisms. So it gets a bit of a deep dive. But um, basically, one one way that people were looking at was this thing called AMP. So you know how I said ATP gets broken down to ADP, and then you put the phosphate back on again. So it is in triphosphate to diphosphate. Well, it can also be broken down further to AMP, so it is in monophosphate. And that tends to show that, oh, you've got a bit of an energy deficit here, right? So that, that then activates... AMP kinase, so AMP activated protein kinase. And then there's a whole thing for a while there that we all thought it was regulating glucose uptake and fat oxidation and whatever. And then that's a whole debate. Um, you know, we showed a while ago that we didn't think it was regulating it. And maybe there's other things kick in if you haven't got it and whatever. So let's not worry about going into that. But that was a whole nother, I could spend an hour talking about that one. But um, basically, he said, what was it like having the first AMP kinase? So yeah, in, two, in the year 2000, um, we came out with uh, there was three different groups all came out with this first studies in humans mm -hmm. showing that exercise activates AMP kinase and muscle. And there's a guy, Bruce Kent, who's like an absolute legend here in Melbourne, um, who actually we collaborated. So he's an AMP kinase group. So we're saying if there is an is, if there is a Nobel Prize in AMP kinase, he might be like fourth or fifth, and they only ever give out three is the most. <laughs> so like, but um, anyway. Uh, so we did the first study and he was so excited that we literally, I think I think you saw my Twitter response. He said, we're going to submit this to Nature, which is the best journal. I just got to shut up this morning. But think, just then, even thinking about that, I got mm -hmm. to shut up this morning. But as I did say on Twitter, it's the fastest turnaround ever because we submitted it because of the time difference. We submitted it like at five o'clock at night or whatever. We go home, go to bed, wake up in the morning. They've been working overnight. So we wake up, right. we check it rejected overnight oh, so no. that was that was one good thing you got a quick turnaround because yeah. the americans are all rejecting it while you're sleeping so anyway it didn't get accepted but um it was pretty nice yeah and i think we did beat we did beat the other two groups out a bit so he was just saying what was that like so yeah that was exciting times um i think his question was were they exciting times so yeah so it was all this talk about amp kinase and we were thinking this was like the holy grail that what was regulating glucose uptake fat oxidation etc um, but then I did a whole bunch of studies and I ended up thinking it wasn't that that mm. important. And then people kind of laughed at me and stuff for about 15 years. And then in 2020, um, another couple of groups started saying it wasn't important. And then suddenly it was like, oh, it's not important. <laughs> I told you that 15 years ago. So, but anyway, that, so those were exciting times. They were high impact, you know, even though it wasn't nature, it was like diabetes and things like that. So high impact journals and um, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, certainly, certainly. That yeah. does sound exciting. And, you know, as, as anybody maybe even with a tiny background in exercise, Fizz will know like AMPK is kind of, you know, taught as this major, major regulator kind of of energy well, flux. I, and, I, hope uh, I hope it's starting to drop off now because um, 
we showed it, it didn't correlate with fat oxidation, glucose uptake, lighting wow. use, nothing back in 2005. Mm. So ever since then, I've done studies showing, so for example, after 10 days of training, it doesn't get activated at all during mm. exercise. Two hours of exercise at 70% doesn't get activated, 65. And then we then we did train people, 65% didn't get activated at all during two hours at 65. So I actually had a paper in 2020 saying, it's time to stop saying AMPK regulates glucose uptake and whatever. So hopefully it's catching on, but I think it might take a while. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Well, yeah. So I would encourage you, maybe this could be something interesting for you to do on your podcast. I think it would be cool for you to do a solo maybe episode on AMPK where you go through the history of it and then kind of talk about your studies. And then you kind of talk about the uh, consensus on AMPK now. That, yeah, that's something yeah. you should do. Well, it's funny. That same guy, Jeff Rothschild, he keeps saying that someone should have been me, you know. Um, and I just felt like it was a bit like, what would you think about if someone, you know what I mean? It just feels a bit conceited. Like, like someone you know, to just... interview you on your own podcast. You yeah, mean? exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we could do a part two a and just weird. talk about AMPK, but no, I think you should do it. I think people would listen. They don't care. It's not a, it's not like a self-righteous thing at all. But that's the other thing. Well, see, what I could do is instead of someone interviewing me on my own podcast, okay, you just interviewed me. And if I put it up on my podcast. Yeah. It just gets a bit. Deep, I don't know. So, yeah, seems, I'll think about that. It's like it seems like a self-promoting thing, but that's okay to do on your own podcast. That's what it's for, right? <laughs> yeah, but then again, you have people like I haven't even heard of these people, but lately they're all over Twitter, like Huberman. You know, he mm -hmm. does two thirds of his podcast just him. Talking. It's just him, yeah, so, just him talking and breaking down research. I've only done, I think like, I've done two episodes like that where I will just talk about like research i don't like them as yeah. much as doing this but it can be interesting yeah i think i i find it awkward but yeah i could just talk about it because for like an hour yeah you could <laughs> just give a lecture and post it up on your uh, podcast it, i'm so much more comfortable when i'm just chatting to someone yeah, yeah it's, like, it's it's better it seems less forced like when i do the intro thing at the start it's so crap if you look at it closely the intro thing i do at the start is about 15 different like edits <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm just like i'm just so crap at doing that Oh, yeah, it's some people are better when they read off a script and some people are better when they're just unscripted saying what comes to their mind. So it, it's, you know, it kind of depends. Yeah, so I do the intro unscripted, but it's just crap. So I have yeah. to keep editing. I, I, script, yeah. I script my intro because if not, it's just rambling and it'll take like 10 minutes and I want to keep it short. <laughs> All right, yeah, well, okay. well, Glenn, I had a great time talking today. I learned a ton and I think that... Um, the audience will learn a lot just about whether it's like basics of exercise metabolism or, you know, the deep dives that we've done. It was all, it was all so fascinating. Um, so thank you again for, for taking some time out of yeah, your, it was, it was your morning. Fun. Yeah. It was a and, lot of fun. Yeah. And you asked a lot of good questions. So I, I, I'm impressed with you actually. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I mean, I would hope I asked some good questions. I am, you know, if soon, I, soon to be a expert in this. <laughs> it's funny. I'm still, I'm still not used to being um, not, working full time so my brain started thinking i wonder if he wants to do a postdoc it's like hang on but you're not actually i was going to like try and recruit you, you know? yeah well i would have to I'm yeah i would have to convince my i'd have to convince my wife to move to australia i don't know if she would be uh <laughs> too keen on that well my, my wife's american and she loves it she can't can't imagine not living yeah, in all right. yeah i'm sure we could get behind it eventually but uh yeah so again if you, if okay. you want to do yeah if you want to do a round two sometime glenn you're always you're always welcome on and we have much more to talk about so <laughs> just let me know yeah so that stuff we didn't get to is, is pretty fun yeah. yeah i'm gonna bookmark it i'm gonna put some notes on the things that we didn't cover and maybe sometime down down the pipeline we can we can cover those but um what we covered today was was plenty and let we... me let me say one minute so just as a as a, as a as a spoiler so basically you put a you put a a, a rat okay these are rats right you put a rat farther on a high fat diet and then they he conceives and he's gone he's literally like dead then the offspring get diabetes. If you exercise either the mother during the pregnancy, you can fix a lot of it, or you exercise the offspring when they're young, you can fix a lot of it. So that's a bit of a bit of a bit of a sport, a bit of a what do you call it? A teaser. Teaser. Yeah, okay, te mate. Teaser for next time. Great. <laughs> you can cut that out if you like. Okay, mate. All right, Glenn. See ya. Have a great rest Thanks. of the day. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. See Bye. ya. Bye.